And sometimes it's, it's tempting for us to, to come to the conclusion that, well, because there are so many arguments against Joseph Smith, well, then there must be some truth to the fact that maybe he wasn't uh, a prophet of God. But if we were to apply that same standard to the Savior of all mankind, what was Jesus most often accused of? Apparently, when I meet with uh, people who are struggling in their faith like that, have they fully contemplated what it is they're giving up if they give up Joseph Smith as a prophet? The most complete document that we have of characters that were drawn off of the gold plates, so probably a lot of you have seen them. Okay, so the question was, uh, Joseph Smith uh, brought back the concept of plural marriage, and, and what, what do we know about whether or not he practiced it? I mean, so he said, how do you respond to someone who makes a big deal out of the fact there's multiple accounts of the first vision? Nuance, ho. And, and having studied... Hello, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Uh, I want to welcome my bud, Bill Real, to the show. Hey, Bill. Kara, how are you? Doing good. Let's Excellent. put us on this nice vision. Um, yeah, Bill, thanks for joining me on this. Uh, Bill is uh, hosts a podcast called Mormonism Live, um, has a whole podcast platform, Mormon Discussions. Do you want to give people a little introduction if they don't know who you are and how cool you are? And how, yeah, I've been in this arena. Fan? Yeah, yeah. I've been in this arena about uh, a decade. Started this in 2012 with my own singular podcast. And over the years, we've added others. So at this point, we're a nonprofit. We uh, have 11 podcasts, 11 podcasters. You can go to mormondiscussions.org, see the full umbrella, click whichever ones appeal to you because they each tackle religious ideas or Mormonism from uh, their own unique angles. And uh, I've been having these fun conversations again for about a decade. And I'm, I'm really excited because when you sent me what we're going to talk about today, um, there are moments where things need to be said. And I'm really <laughs> glad that you tackled this. Yeah, um, I will get into uh, where I got this from in just a second. But I always love uh, when you join me and chat with me. I'm like, I'm Bill Real's number one fan. Bill is, is who I credit well, with single-handedly. I'm one of your biggest me, fans so. too. I appreciate what uh, you're doing. Thanks, man. So, hey, everyone. So if you're new to my channel, my name is Nuance Ho. Sometimes I go by Kara Burrell. Sometimes I work at Mormon Stories. And sometimes I take polls from my YouTube audience on what they want to see me do most. And the poll was, it came in <laughs> uh, responding to the insanely stupid arguments of apologists. So mm. um, not only is this video, it got sent to me um, about two days ago, but it's from my home stake in Provo, Utah. So mm. this is personal because my friends and family we're listening to this and mm -hmm. taking it in and sunlight has to be the best disinfectant. So I'm really excited because I have created a thorough debunking. I was laughing maniacally. Oh. So I think you guys will, Oh man, I can't wait to hear your commentary. You guys are going to laugh out loud at some of these things and there's a Q and a at the end. So please buckle in tight. Oh God. Mm -hmm. So that might be uh, my favorite part. <laughs> yeah. um, and then um, I was also trying to see, if um, anyone's ever done a breakdown of Mormonism Unveiled, um, like a YouTube video or anything, and I couldn't find anything. Um, so Mormonism Unveiled, I want to explain what that is because I couldn't find any more other information. So um, that's a main point of Garrett's talk here. So I downloaded, this is how your girl does it. I downloaded Dan Vogel's commentary on Mormonism Unveiled, first anti-Mormon book on Kindle, read it all yesterday, summarized it here in this video for you. So I want to give people all of the context possible. So if you're a faithful Mormon watching this, don't hate me. I'm just trying to give you a more well-rounded picture of a system that you won't get that from because it's based on information control and emotional manipulation. I don't know. So um, yeah, if you, uh, if you like this video and you can see how much time and research that I'm putting into it and you want more, please let me know and I will accept um, donations for my Patreon. A couple bucks a month helps. Donor box, Venmo, all those links are down below. And only about 50% 50 of people who watch my videos are subscribers. So it's just, you know, sometimes you got to make a girl happy and say, Carrie, you did a good job in this video. Here's a little tip or whatever. So super chats are also welcome. This is live right now. Thanks everyone for joining us. This uh, it's Wednesday, March 1st and snowing outside how's how's weather for you it has rained the last uh, couple of days uh temperatures kind of moderate you know 40s 50s uh so not terribly cold but really wet outside yeah we've we've anyone in northern utah knows that we've been getting dumped with snow so uh we're nice we're tucked into our nice warm beds we're gonna do a debunking of an apologist video right now and uh, Bill, you used to do some, you used to dabble in the Mormon apologetics, didn't you? Yeah. So I was with Fair Mormon specifically in 2013, the last time they won the podcast awards 
I was running their podcast. I get a little thank you on the stage. I've never let them live that down. Uh, but spent probably two to three years with Fair Mormon answering uh, the difficult questions behind the scenes for those who had doubts or questions and really got to see that organization sort of up close. And uh, I, you can tell me your quick thoughts because um, I... Um, as somebody who went through a faith crisis, I've always said that uh, Mormon apologetics are like the last pit stop on the way out for somebody who desperately wants to know the tr truth, you know, and and um, I've heard so many people through the years, myself included, say that they went to Fair Mormon or, you know, a BYU bookstore or wherever to look up what these what the arguments are and being like, that's the best that they can do. That's the best. Oh, OK. So it's just not a true thing, because <laughs> if you gave no answers, I could have just literally put it on the shelf. But the answers that they do give. Um, while apologists are obviously not the best, uh, they're, they, they, tr they try to have it both ways. They say that we don't actually like represent the official things of the church, but then the church itself or the leaders are not theologians and historians and stuff. They want to outsource that stuff to the other guys. And so if they make good arguments, then yay, you stay in the, your testimony. But then if they say something stupid, <laughs> then they can say, well, those, they, they're not, you know, official for the church or whatever. Do you have any? Yeah, they, they <laughs> yeah. attempt to create... Uh, I want to make sure I get this right because RFM will not let me live it down. Deniable plausibility, right? So what they do is yeah. most of us, when we're trying to be critical thinkers, we're trying to come up with the conclusion that is most rational, most logical, which means it's the one that requires the least amount of extra allowances or extra conjecture. And what apologists do is they can't do that because that's not almost in all of the messy, sticky issues, it's not the most reasonable, rational answer. So they come in and go, well, yeah, but other things are possible. And so they give you the second most rational answer or the 32nd most rational answer. And uh, it's a game that gets played. And the other game that they'll play is they'll say, oh, these criticisms, criticisms have been brought up for 200 years. We've already addressed them. Yes, they have been brought up for 200 years. Yes. You already addressed them, but you gave us the less than most rational answer, and everybody deserves the opportunity to be aware of that and to wrestle with it. Absolutely. Well said. Um, yeah, because there's 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 good it's it's hard because um and I think you understand this dilemma as like an ex-Mormon podcaster, is you have your audience is sometimes actual, you know, people in a faith crisis trying to sort that out. And then there's also people who are never Mo's and, you know, evangelical Christians, and they just want a, a point and laugh at the absurdities of Mormonism. Mm -hmm. And they're yeah. absolutely there. Um, but it's really, I try to make content for people like me four years ago who are desperately trying to sort out and just to be here to validate that if that's the situation that you're in, that you're not taking crazy pills that, mm -hmm. you know, I want to validate people, you know, make them laugh if I, if I can, because there's going to be these people who speak for authority um, in the church that they can say that, you know, I've read everything and don't figure out, like, don't worry about what the haters have to say. And they kind of retell you to be tribal and have you fall back on an emotional testimony. And when you already know that that paradigm's not working anymore, um, their poor arguments are just not holding up anymore. And so this video that I got that basically been leaked, it's interesting to see what is being said to the actual membership of the church because he's going to be addressing people if you're struggling with your testimony hey listen to me i'm in a place of authority i have another video i did um a couple months ago uh jared halverson who i met up he saw the video afterwards he said i got some things wrong got some things right and i stand by that video 100 percent. i met up with him and had lunch and i want to be nice to a mormon apologist but i also want to say like you know better than this you know that these logical fallacies yeah. are so blatant and apparent and um yeah people People are not forgetting their testimony. We're just becoming better stewards of critical thinking and history. Um, so, especially in 2023, when we know the psycholo the, the psychology of belief. So, for instance, Jonathan Haidt, right, in elevation emotion, the exactly. illusory truth effect, the confirmation bias, backfire effect, belief persistence. We know how the brain wants to hold on to its comfortable beliefs. And Mormonism comes along and it manipulates a general truth, which is elevation emotion. And it calls it the Holy Ghost. Exactly. And hence, um, and hence, all arguments are torn down from the doubter or questioner being encouraged to look at the issue in a rational, logical way. And instead, they're being taught like, no, 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 no. Don't do it that way. Trust your feelings. You've asked. And, 
And again, on this side of things, we recognize that there is a hundred faiths of people who feel feelings, who think their church is true, including fundamentalist Mormons that the LDS church would absolutely have to hold is not the true church and has apostatized. Exactly. Um, and when and when this information is heard, whether it's just understanding our own brain and our own biases down to the history to yeah conflicting uh, discrepancies in the first vision or anachronisms, all of these things, it does feel like smoking gun after smoking gun. And um, when the information is heard, it's usually thought stopped. Like we're going to see in this yeah. when, when apologist is talking, they're going to give you an emotional place to fall back on. And like, remember this experience. Are you, do you really want to give up? Think, think about what you're giving up. If you give up Joseph Smith as a prophet is a main point that you hear, um, which I'm love to say, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give up some things that Joseph Smith taught. Um, but yeah, it, their thought stopped and uh, members who don't thought stop, who continue and they want to learn and they do want to be uh, good stewards of critical thinking that that orthodoxy is going to start nuancing and i've always said for a long time when i the reason i left the church is because for a long time i kept pressing this orthodoxy button of like when you're choosing between two ways to go i was like i'm gonna still go with the leaders the orthodoxy and then over time you realize how that's hurting people gay marriage and you can't you have to start choosing that empathy or that that uh critical thinking or like you just the cognitive dissonance is just weighing too heavily and things are coming crashing down and yeah i just want to create this space for people who are like me four years ago. And um, yeah, so welcome everybody again to the live stream. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube right now, uh, there's a super chat button. It's got a little dollar sign on it. You can especially throw a little cash if you have a comment you want me to put on screen, but I appreciate everybody for being here. And uh, Bill, any other final things before I introduce? I got slides and clips I'm going all over here today. No, I'm super excited. Let's dive into it. All right. So, um, the 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 man that will be speaking us to us today, just so that we have an introduction of his authority, Garrett Dirk Matt. Uh, he's an associate professor, of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University, and Ruby received his PhD from the University of Colorado. Basically, he's run read a bunch of stuff, written a bunch of papers, worked on the Joseph Smith Papers Project, served as editor of those documents, um, counseled fifty minutes. So um, I will say more than more than your average apologist, I think he's been in the thick of it, um, reading uh, all of the things that Joseph Smith has written uh, with the Joseph Smith Papers Project. So um, that's his that's his level of authority that he's coming at you with. That he's like, I have read everything. He even has a video, a clip in this video that I I am not showing, but he'll say, you know, people will come up to me and be like, well, Joseph Smith did this, and he's like, no, it doesn't say that because I wrote the Joseph Smith Papers Project. So. He kind of uses that as a, a club, but that is impressive to a group of a bunch of Mormons from my home stake in Provo. Um, but it's not as impressive when we can uh, absolutely point out your blatant lies, Garrett, because uh, we have uh, other documents and other evidence that you're not sharing with the congregation at that time. Also, and I'll thanks. just, the only thing I would add to this one is just to note that I've been in interaction with lots of historians who work for the church history department who have participated in working on the Joseph Smith Papers Project. And, and, and the same this holds true for uh, the apologist in this arena too, the neo-apologists. And, and I only use that term to separate them from the old style, but mm -hmm. Patrick Mason and Terrell Givens, Richard Bushman. What I find with the historians as well as with uh, the apologist is that off the record, they often uh, articulate their positions much more liberally than they do uh, in public. So when they're talking privately to me. Yeah. Um, and, and so you realize that all of us compartmentalize and we all test whether a space is safe to be authentic and that publicly these men portray a much more faithful view of the church and privately they're willing to concede a lot more points. And so anybody on the front end who only hears these public conversations, you deserve to know that. Yeah. And what I'm hearing you say is that people like this, who they know the nitty gritty details of the church, when they are asked to speak to a congregation of just regular old Mormon folk um, for a stake, what's the state conference meeting or whatever, um, they're obviously going to hide those. Those conversations are going to be amongst their in crowd and they're going to admit that they they have some issues and problems, but they're going to present the most insanely whitewashed like truth spun version 
they're going to take the yeah. regular the regular audience they're right? going to take advantage of the lack of people being informed in that space and that's why it's so exciting that it's leaked because i want to make sure <laughs> that we add some context of yeah. hey if this is what you're telling people i think you know better i think i think you're going out of your way to lie to people and that's not okay um, I've even been in line at a pizza place with John DeLynn once and he got a text message from a famous Mormon apologist and he's like, whoa. And I was like, ooh, what did it say? I probably should be saying this, but anyway, <laughs> basically said uh, something happened in the news and he was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. And uh, yeah, they, I, I'm that, sure you've heard the them time. say that too. Yeah. yeah. Where it's like, and they continue to work for the church. But I'll tell you one other, and I'll, I've said this multiple times, and I'm going to keep saying it because I'm not going to let it live it down. I was at a dinner with a well-known apologist. Everyone would recognize the name. I'm at a dinner table with a friend of mine who can vouch for that story, as well as a neutral source to people that can vouch for that story. And this apologist uh, acknowledged to everyone at the table that the church is a thoroughly corrupt bureaucracy. But that person will never dare say that in the public arena. Mm. Do they are they employed by the church as well? No, like they sign their paychecks. Oh no, no, but they they're before. deeply connected to the church. And again, I if I said the name, I won't. But if I did, I know everyone would recognize it. Interesting, um, the insider knowledge that we have. Anyway, yeah. um, I'm oh, sorry if I also am going to be sucking on a lozenge because I have a sore throat. All right, well. That further tattoo, let's get into it. Um, I'm just gonna play the clips. Bill, if you have something to say, raise your hand. Um, and then they're gonna stop. I have like a little cartoon of my face in between where I think the clip should stop, but you can tell me to stop at any time. Mm -mm. Joseph before, and then even after my time on the on the papers, it um it, you got you got to work on a lot of cool things. I mean, uh this this document is um the most complete document that we have of characters that were drawn off of the gold plates. So probably a lot of you have seen them. I don't know if anyone here has their own, their own seer stone, but you could probably try to take a, let's see if we can figure out, you know, up there you got near the top, that little upside down birthday cake. And then you have upside down birthday cake again. And then upside down birthday cake. And upside down birth probably and it came to pass or something. I don't know. Uh, you, have, you have a couple that repeat, right? Backwards fish head, backwards fish head, backwards fish head. So probably and it came to pass. I can, I, I can seem like there was a lot of them. <laughs> so, um, the reason why I wanted to show that is, uh, again, he's when apologists, when they talk, they're setting themselves up as authority figures. And he's talking about all the cool things that you get to do. And I can't let him just dismiss this because you're talking to a group of Mormons. They don't like cool. The characters of the Book of Mormon, you got to look at the writings, of the golden plates. That, that is, there's the real characters just Smith down and move on with their testimony. Um, I'm going to be pulling a lot of um, things from Mike from LDS discussions. If you don't know Mike from LDS Discussions, he is another amazing genius. Shout out to him. So uh, this is from LDS Discussions website. And uh, I just want to read this just to give some context. These are the things that they leave out that um, one of the more well-known stories about the Book of Mormon production is Martin Harris being sent to Charles Anthon in order to receive some information that Harris was not being duped by Joseph Smith. And uh, he's this linguist, basically. And so before the visit, Joseph copied down a set of characters from the Book of Mormon to take to this ling linguist and Harris met with Anthon and leading to different accounts of what occurred during this visit. Um, and uh, there's another important point that I'm gonna bring this up again. So I just wanted to lay this out. Um, above is a set of characters that Joseph copied directly from the golden plates. Um, the church has used these throughout the years and you can see the images on their official website. However, um, the problem is that these characters in no way resemble Egyptian. So it's just like a cool like flash. Hey, look at I get to work with <laughs> these characters, but they are they're crudely modified English. And during Joseph Smith's lifetime, no one in his area was able to read Egyptian and news of the Rosetta Stone and not reached his area. And uh, reformed Egyptian is obviously not a thing. And shout out to uh, Sandra and Gerald Tanner. They uh, copied every single one precisely and put it into an alphabet and it says joseph smith claimed these characters are reformed egyptian some critics however feel they are deformed english just using his exact same alphabet um and so these characters that are all that we have to validate the the golden plates and again shows joseph smith's fingerprints all over the translation process uh and then Finally, this is another really important point from Mike that these characters 
uh, oh, I already read that, sorry, um, that if Joseph Smith's characters from the Book of Mormon had any legitimacy whatsoever, the church would be using them in every material as proof of the Book of Mormon's ancient authenticity. Instead, they're using made up characters in videos, despite having the characters um, on a document to cite them from. Um, and I think that tells you everything you need to know about the Book of Mormon characters. Um, so right there in the middle, you can see those are Joseph Smith's characters that are strange looking alphabets. And then when the church is like, this was translated from a reformed addiction, they, they up their game on that one. So just an important context to point out that, uh, that's not a good thing. That's not a, that's not a, a, a win for you guys <laughs> to show that. Any yeah. Not only as you're pointing out, do the characters look like things that Joseph could have just fiddled with within the English language, the number system and the letters, but Charles Anton, uh, on two different occasions, uh, goes to a newspaper and shares his side of the story. And you can go read that. Mm -hmm. And there are things that Anton says that corroborate the visit of Martin Harris. And there are things that deeply disagree with the story. And so those of us who grew up in Mormonism, and again, I joined as a 17 year old, but I was in it early enough to kind of hear these stories. We were told a certain way that that event went down. And when you go and read Charles Anton's own words and you learn certain things. So one of the things you learn is that by the time we get to Martin Harris, which is only the first 116 pages that we don't have today, there's already acknowledgement from Anton that he's aware that the Nephite spectacles, Martin Harris is claiming the Nephite spectacles are way too big and he can't be used. He, they can't use them. So Joseph's already moved to the seer stone. And mm -hmm. again, it's, part of the history that we tell about these Nephite spectacles when the reality is a stone in the hat is almost assuredly used for the entire hundred percent of the translation of the Book of Mormon we have today. And most likely there were never any spectacles to begin with. Right. And most likely no reformed re Egyptian that even exists mm -hmm. because the translation process was just, a uh, rock in a hat with some type of tighter, loose translation of the words appearing yeah. thusly. So and, why do you need transformed Egyptian anyway? And to know reformed Egyptian should look sort of like Egyptian. It's adapted, right? We took the Egyptian language and we adapted it, but it looks like something completely other than Egyptian, which means you started from scratch and you created something else. So again, if you use your rational mind, it seems sort of absurd. 100%. All right. Uh, next clip. We live in a world where um, people have negative things to say about the prophet Joseph Smith. This always comes as a surprise to us, I think, because we're not expecting it when someone says something about uh, someone that we care about, uh, someone who's uh, a part of, of why we have our testimony of Jesus. And yet at the same time, that's exactly what Joseph was told from the very beginning. The angel told him that his name would be had for good and evil. And yet every time we hear it had for evil, we're, it still doesn't make it easy. The people can attack your testimony of Joseph. Um, yeah, his name is going to be had for good and evil <laughs> all across the world. I was just talking about this on uh, Mormon stories the other night. Uh, yeah, when you kind of bake in to the argument that like, I might do some evil things and people might say that I'm going to be doing some evil things. So just watch out for if they say that about me. Like, what's the most like Occam's razor, like logical thing? Do you think like he said that? after he started doing some things. <laughs> Any comments to that clip? Yeah, just that, go, I don't, we can't go back to it, but the picture there is Joseph Smith being visited by Moroni in his bedroom. And I can go back to it, yeah. Just to note uh, that the brothers, they show him in bed, I believe, uh, is if, you, if there's a way to kind of yep. scroll back to right where that picture was. There it yep. is. So again, we tell this story and the way we were told it when, when I was young was that it was never really described that there were other people in the room. It's just Joseph and Moroni and they have this experience. He appears three times. Then once again, I think in the morning, but there's those brothers in bed and you have to at least talk about it. If you're going to show the picture and at least acknowledge that if you're going to be honest with your crowd, that it seems like a strange thing to have this one room with a bunch of kids in a bed and the angel wakes one of them up somehow, the other stay asleep and you have this long detailed conversation over the course of an entire night. And those kids all just stay sound asleep in REM sleep, dreaming dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back then, aren't they uh, used to 
you can hear me, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm just checking. Um, they're used to like an entire family sharing a bed, right? You're like your parents are like making your younger sibling like two bodies over at that point, yeah. At best, there were three sleeping areas in this home: one for girls, one for boys, and one for the parents. Got it. All right. Uh, let me turn this back on. That his name would be had for good and evil. And yet, every time we hear it had for evil, we're, it still doesn't make it easy. The people can attack your testimony of Joseph Smith anywhere and at any time. Rarely will it be in a format so provocative. More so now, you find it in an online format. You find it with a TikTok or a meme that sh- someone shares, or an Instagram post that claims to have some kind of pithy new insight. The reality is, from the very beginning, people attacked Joseph Smith. Uh, When the Book of Mormon was first published, people couldn't decide whether they would attack Joseph Smith for writing the Book of Mormon because it's not the Bible and therefore can't be true, or if they would claim that someone else wrote the Book of Mormon and uh, and, and attack him in that regard. Um, These attacks on Joseph uh, came from all different places. In 1833, one of the most prolific antagonists of the church, uh, of the early church, was a a man by the name of Philastus Hurlbut, uh, Dr. Philastus Hurlbut. He uh, was an elder in the church and went on a mission, and on his mission, uh, he committed various uh, indiscretions. And so he used that to his advantage. The term elder is a really big deal. I was an elder of the Mormon church. I know what they, right? I wish I had an image of Dr. Flassus Robot to show you, um, but I don't. So I'm just going (laughs) to, I'm just going to come up with artist renditions. Um, What he may have looked like, I don't know. Okay. Uh, And and before you start thinking that like, well, I mean, look, he obviously had to be a super educated guy. He was a doctor. I mean, look look at the doctor up here, down talking another doctor. But this is a real issue. Now, why do I even spend any time on this? Because Dr. Philastus Hurlbut, the good doctor, is going to be hired by the local anti-Mormon committee in Kirtland to go back to Pennsylvania and New York and to collect as many negative affidavits as he can about Joseph Smith and about the Smith family and the founding of the church and the translation of the Book of Mormon. Surprisingly, being paid for each of these negative affidavits, he brings back negative affidavits. Now, in fact, I don't, we have zero of these original affidavits. I actually don't know what he got or what other people said to him. All I know is what this uh, antagonistic newspaper editor, Eber Howe, published in the first anti-Mormon book. I would say, if you have ever read something negative about the prophet Joseph Smith from his early life, there is probably a 90% likelihood that you can trace it back to this book of these affidavits collected by this twice excommunicated fornicator. Let me do it like uh, this one. No, that's not the one I wanted. This one. There we go. Um, So I'd be curious, audience, let me know, how many of you have ever heard of Mormonism Unveiled, um, Edie Howe, um, yeah, Flassus Hurlbut, which I can't wait because I'm going to have to say his name to talk about this 1,000 times. So thanks to them. I really think his first name was probably Doctor. It literally was Doctor. That's the one point he makes in this. I think that if you know that you're going to name your kid, like, his last name is Hurlbut. His first name is going to be Flassus. I'm already stuck on that. Let's name him Doctor so he'll have like a little bit of a better ego about life. But that's a different story. Um, so I'd be curious how many people have, have heard these stories before because I've spent a lot of time in Mormonism. And I remember um, going to the Book of Mormon Evidence Conference with a lot of more fundamentalist people. And they are all about debunking Mormonism unveiled. Like that was like their thing to do. And I was like, I've been working at Mormon Stories for a year and I never really even heard of it. And I've I read a lot of stuff. So, um, uh, Bill, have you ever gotten your hands on the old Mormonism unveiled? Yeah, I have a copy here. It is, um, up on the shelf underneath the top two. It is Dan Vogel's, uh, edition where he adds commentary to the entire yes. book. And I've, I've read it and, and find it quite interesting. It, it, the only thing I would say here is that I feel like he's treating Mormonism unveiled in the same way that Latter-day Saints and scholars, Mormon believing scholars and apologists of a generation treated Fawn Brody and No Man Knows My History, which is Mm. to discount the author, which is ad hominem, by the way. Um, (laughs) If you attack the author, even if they're, again, you get to talk about credibility issues, that's real. But if you use credibility issues as a way to dismiss actually getting into the arguments of the person's exactly. perspective. Yeah. Then you're creating just an ad hominem to kind of get your crowd to go like, ah, he's a bad guy. Don't worry about it. And the reality is that when you look at Mormonism unveiled today, most neutral scholars would admit that the book is full of things that should be considered seriously, including Richard Bushman from rough stone rolling. Yeah, exactly. It's a classic ad hominem. And I don't know if people in his crowd are like, can we actually like, well, what did he say? Like, you'll find this a lot with Mormon apologists. They want to say, yes, ad hominem attacks, or they want to be like, these people are just kind of out to tear down the church. The church that you know is true. They're our enemy. Oh my gosh, look at, they freaking look like Darth Vader, you know? Like they, 
they have no problem with just going to the lowest common, like low hanging fruit without, I always, I'm like, ha, ha, what, ha. Yeah. You know, what, what did they have to say? And so, um, there, Oh, before I get into it, thanks, Michelle Fisher. Your super chat is so welcome. Appreciate you. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, like I said, I downloaded <laughs> that book the, yesterday and I, I just thought it was so interesting because I want to know what are the claims that Garrett just said? Cause as we go through the course of this video, he lies bold face so many times. And I was like, okay, well, I want to know what is, what is the best source for this? So if you'll notice, he starts by saying by this twice excommunicated fornicator, that's what they call like priming your audience <laughs> for, for, you know, you're doubting your testimony of Joseph Smith. Well, the very first person who ever put all this anti-Mormon stuff out there, twice excommunicated fornicator, not like Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was a very faithful, obvious man. All the, all the teenagers he had sex with, that was a fornication, you know? Right. So, um, let's stick with me because you will not find another. Oh, go, go ahead. And build. Just, just to say, if, if we don't have children from this relationship, then we should start with the assumption that they didn't have sexual relations, shouldn't we? <laughs> Did he have any kids from them? Mm, yeah. Perfect. And maybe he is a twice excommunicated fornicator. But the point being is that if you measure Joseph Smith by the very same standard that they're choosing to measure uh, Philastus Hurlbut, then the reality is that you have to be willing to call Joseph Smith an umpteen, yeah. you know, maybe fornicator. not excommunicated per se, but an umpteen fornicator. Yes, sir. So um, I just, I don't like when people lie. Um, Ex-Mormons out there, I think one of the main things, it's not necessarily just that like your first thing is, oh, that's like, I didn't, I, I'm not comfortable with this doctor and I'm not comfortable with this. So many things. It's like, I was in church and they just lied to me. They'll just lie to you. That's what's so freaking annoying. They will just sit there and lie to your face. So I pre present to you um, a side-by-side -side of what Garrett said. Um, about Mormonism Unveiled and its production versus um, reading uh, Dan Vogel's commentary on Dan Vogel's so dope, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to give an introduction mm -hmm. to Dan Vogel too. So um, Mormonism Unveiled and uh, you, there you can go download it if you want to. And uh, one, one excerpt from the introduction, Dan says, um, perhaps the demands of leadership and pressure of potential converts prevented Joseph from, or Joseph Smith, from speaking more honestly and clearly about his past. And they're talking about treasure digging basically there. However, in a roundabout way, his discomfort increased public curiosity and added to the value historians place on the interviews with Smith's neighbors. We're going to get into the affidavits that were collected about them being a bunch of scallywags. Within the affidavits are answers to questions that arise from passing references to various obscure topics. Only now, after the passage of time, are we able to weigh the testimonies in a reasonable way and ask which of them provide helpful information about otherwise unanswered historical questions and which of them are exaggerated or tainted by jealousy and self-justification on the neighbor's part. Um, and yeah, if you, uh, this, Dan Vogel is a bibliography indexing king, <laughs> by the way. So, um, uh, Garrett, um, uh, oh, I had my description. I had, a, I wrote a, a bio for, I typed it out, but I can't find it right now. Let me find it real quick. Cause I don't want to miss, um, making sure everyone knows who Dan Vogel is if you needed. Um, yeah. So Dan Vogel is an independent researcher and writer and author of a number of works that include Joseph Smith, the making of a prophet. Um, that's one of my favorite books, by the way. Uh, it's a real page turner along with this one and most well known for his, uh, early work on Mormon documents. Uh, and he's debated Mormon apologists and scholars. And though, uh, Let's see what else I want to say. He's been criticized by ex-Mormons and anti-Mormons for not being sufficiently critical of Joseph Smith. And he's won awards for best editing bibliography from different Mormon history associations. So, Bill, I would say that um, I think I think Dan Vogel is quite fair. So I'm going to be um, comparing the, the claims of Garrett against um, all of the research and collection of what's what Dan Vogel has to say about the same story. Dan Vogel impresses me in the same way that D. Michael Quinn impressed me, that both of those uh, men deeply value the data. They tend to not overreach very often. Mm -hmm. They tend to kind of just fall right in the line of like what we can say as historians, uh, whereas folks like maybe you and me, we're going to cross the line just a little bit because we're going to go with the most rational answer 
And if it allows a little bit of conjecture, it's still the most rational answer. We're going to talk about that conjecture. Whereas those two, uh, and now we're talking about Dan Vogel, uh, will stop right at that line and tend to really value their, uh, an honest approach as a historian. Right. Yeah. I, I, I love his works and you can, you can make your, draw your own assumptions after he lays out the data and you go to the back of the thing and there is a, every single sentence you can go and find where that is written in the archives and things. So, so Garrett's claims in this one Thalassus Hurlbut was excommunicated for sex on his mission. Um, I didn't want to completely play his entire thing because he tells so many dumb jokes. Sorry, Garrett. I'm sure that's really funny on the softball thing, but we have, we have stuff we got to do. So <laughs> excommunicated for sex on his mission is a claim that he makes um, that uh, he begged to be let back into the church. Uh, three Joseph sees him as ultra repentant and lets Thalassus back in the church. Four, Flassus commits adultery the next day and is excommunicated again. Five, he then is hired by anti-Mormons to collect affidavits about Joseph. Um, six, Joseph writes a letter to the saints that they are being persecuted by Hurlbut out of spite for ousting him after a lewd and adulterous conduct. Those are Joseph's words. Um, uh, also, that his spelling is evidence that he couldn't have written the Book of Mormon. Did I already do seven? Am I an idiot? Nope. Six, seven. Great. Seven. Hurlbut makes so many public threats against Joseph Smith. He is convicted of threatening to wound, beat, or kill Joseph, and a bond is put in place to keep the peace, which is saying a lot because Mormons were so persecuted, they never won any court cases before then. Eight. Hurlbut is paid to collect negative statements about Joseph Smith, so he collects negative statements about Joseph Smith. Nine, we don't have any of the original affidavits, only was published in Mormonism Unveiled, the first anti-Mormon book. That's a lot of claims. Well, there's a lot of evidence. <laughs> um, so stop me literally at any time because I read this freaking thing last night and th things are possible on ADHD medication, I'll tell you that much. So um, I um, literally stop me at any time because um, these are 31 flavors of truth. <laughs> Uh, so these are the, this, if you want to know the actual long context, there's always more context that you're not going to be given when you're just talking to somebody who works for the LDS church. So the fuller context is that Mormonism unveiled published by Edie Howe in 1834, early 20th century Mormon leader, BH Roberts, BH Roberts called it the first anti-Mormon book and the chief source of all information. Its importance was largely achieved through the inclusion of 15 affidavits that were gathered from Palmyra and Manchester, New York, dealing with the Smith's family's reputation and seven others from Harmony, Pennsylvania, concerning Smith's activities. Edie Howe was a newspaper publisher. His leanings were anti-Mason, anti-Jackson, anti-slavery, and then anti-Mormon. In the small town of Kirtland, Ohio, where A.D. Howe resided, the minister, Sidney Rignan, and most of his congregation were converted to Mormonism. Joseph Smith moved the church there four months later, and the surrounding towns became the center of Mormon activity. E.D. Howe was upset by these newcomers' takeover of the town, who wouldn't be, and their support for Andrew Jackson, that douchebag. <laughs> Trail of Tears, ever heard of it? And the Mormons converting his wife and her sister. Uh, because of his anti-Mason leanings, he read the Book of Mormon for himself and found the Nephites to be very anti-Mason and Christian, as if the writer foresaw the politics of New York in 1828 through 1829. Just that's a quote from Edie Howe. And anyone who reads the Book of Mormon should also be like, uh, like, wow, he really did a lot of uh, talking about like Columbus and stuff and uh, really understanding the politics of the day. And it's very much written with a... Uh, you know, the fingerprints of Joseph Smith all over it. Any comments up to here, Bill, or should I go on? No, just the, I guess I should say one, only that what, to what you just said, one only needs to look to what Richard Bushman has said about the book of Mormon appearing to be a 19th century product full of 19th century sermons, 19th century language. And he says that it's something that we're going to have to deal with if we're going to be uh, intellectually honest in uh, our dive into Book of Mormon historicity. Exactly. Thank you. Um, eight, Edie Howe disliked the secrecy of Mormon meetings and still likened them to Masons, complaining many converts included zealous Masons and that the Book of Mormon was even printed for the world from a Masonic printing office. So this is where it gets juicy. This is where it really 
is so interesting to me. So I'm going to talk to you like I'm talking to a girlfriend. So, so Edie Howe was suspicious of Mormons and wanted to investigate the origins of the church in New York, but Sidney Rigdon to Jasper J. Moss admitted in 19 or in 1844 that the church kept its early meeting secret because they knew the world would laugh at them, charge them with trying to overthrow the government and think that they were laying plans to get money and surely shed their blood if they heard what Mormons believed. So they partook of the Lord's Supper at night with darkened windows and all of this secrecy, so you can imagine got attention of non-Mormons and led them to initially being associated with Masons. Ever heard of the Barbra Streisand effect? <laughs> that which you try to cover up and hide um, will become, all, yeah, always becomes bigger. So people are like, yo, you guys are being really sec secretive. What's going on? So during the early years of the church, Joseph Smith was very resistant to questions about his past or the production of the Book of Mormon from anyone, including his own brother. At a conference of elders in October 1831, Hiram asked for more details about his discovery of the golden plates. And Joseph said it was not intended to tell the world all the particulars of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And I'm sure, Bill, as you know, there's um, <laughs> so many, so many reasons that that uh, that Joseph Smith is such a, a crazy, crazy con man um, because his his dealings in New York with his treasure digging and finally kind of being run out of town um, and the the court case there and so many upset townspeople. He just kind of wanted to leave that in, a, in the past and move on. But there's still people who are going to have whispers of what Joseph was up to. And he wants to move on and be a prophet now. And he doesn't want people associating him with the treasure digging anymore. Yeah. And I'll only add, I think it's the reason why all of us were taught a story about Nephite spectacles and it was left be. Because if the church starts to talk about a rock and a hat, all of us want to know where the rock came from. Mm -hmm. And it takes us back to Joseph Smith beginning his treasure digging uh, adventures at the age of 13. We know that he asked Sally Chase if he can use her green seer stone. He then uh, looks into it and alleges that he sees that he has his own white seer stone 150 miles away, buried under a tree. He disappears for a few days, comes back. He's got a, ro uh, a white rock. And I'm thinking, I've got four kids. And I've had some strange things happen with my kids. It is really hard for me to imagine one of my kids at the age of 13 already beginning to um, take advantage of people trying to find lost items and things. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll add this, which is the, another reason they don't want us to talk about the rock and the hat in the past. Now they're starting to have to because of the internet. But one of the other reasons is that the, the treasure digging was Joseph Smith using a magic rock to find uh, gold or silver treasures buried in the ground that were protected by guardian spirits. And then he does the Book of Mormon, which is also involves a rock to find uh, lost things, essentially. Uh, he uses that to translate the Book of Mormon. They're gold plates buried in the ground and once again protected by a guardian spirit. And, and so when you start to read all the early treasure digging stories, you start to realize where the idea of gold plates and guardian spirits and magic occult to, to locate things where all that comes in because it plays itself out over and over and over again in the treasure digging stories. Thank you. Perfect summary. Yeah. Who wouldn't want to be like, that was the past. I think the only apologetic that I think barely works right now is people will say he was just like hired to do some digs. It wasn't like his thing. He was just like, this is illegal. I'm going to stop now. And if you read Dan Vogel's book, Joseph Smith, making of a prophet, I think that's the name of it. Oh my gosh, the court documents. There's a, he said, she said, we have so much evidence. There's so many scribes in this. Like it is a full law and order drama of what actually happened. There's so much more evidence and it's not it is not, let me say, just Joseph was just hired a couple times and just mm, it's the furthest thing from the truth. Dan um, Vogel also has a, uh, I'm trying to find it right now, a PDF on uh, Palmyra and the treasure digging. And uh, there are multiple sites. It's not like he dug once or twice. And these, by the way, you can go back to our episode on, I forget what the full name of it was, but it included the words gold thrones uh, in it. And it was one of the early episodes of Mormonism Live. And we show one of these, uncovered treasure digs and it is monumental it's the side of a hill mm -hmm. probably as big as my like my office uh or bigger 12 by 12 but essentially they dig into the side of a hill and they remove all of the dirt from inside 
this would have taken days and days and days uh, to do. But the the PDF that I'm going to put here in the links uh, is, um, let me see it here real quick, the locations of Joseph Smith's early treasure quest. And you can read, these were not uh, these were not just a few treasure digs and Joseph gave up only making 14 bucks a month. These mm -hmm. were really serious, uh, a serious number of them. And the breadth and scope of each treasure dig was serious as well. Exactly. Also, quick shout out to Maven said, I wish I could hang out the whole time, but just want to say hi. She's probably gone by now, but hey, Maven. Um, yeah. So we're talking about the situation in which Joseph and his uh, Mormons are moving over to Ohio and taking over the town and people are like, who are they? Where did they come from? How did this book of Mormon get here? And Joseph's like, you guys asked too many questions. Suspicious much. So former strong leaders in the church fought with Joseph and left outing several problems with him in the church publicly. That's a whole other two hour podcast <laughs> that I put in one sentence. But uh, so this tense atmosphere combined with the lack of solid information or explanation from Joseph Smith created the market for books on Mormonism. Uh, into the vacuum came Flasses Hurlbut, a convert in 1832 and lay minister, and he traveled to Kirtland to see the prophet up close. And Joseph wrote that they talked at length about the Book of Mormon together, and he told Joseph that if he ever found out that the Book of Mormon was false, he would make it his mission to destroy Joseph Smith. Um, Hurlbut was sufficiently reassured by Joseph it was true. He was ordained an elder by Sidney Rigdon five days later, then accepted a mission call to Pennsylvania. On his way to his mission, Hurlbut met a staunch Methodist and former friend of Solomon Spaulding named Lyman Jackson. He said the Book of Mormon may have been copied from an Indian romance his friend Solomon had uh, had written two decades earlier. Um, so diverted from his mission, Hurlbut travels to see Solomon Spaulding's younger brother and interviews his family about this theory. Faced with the possibility that the Book of Mormon was derivative, Hurlbut abandons his mission and returns home to Ohio. So is there anything in there about <laughs> sleeping, any kind of adulterous affairs, um, sexual impropriety? Is there anything in that? No, there's not, there's not a single record. No, nope. Not from the church, not from Philastus. Nothing. This is all you get. So when he returned to Kirtland, he learned that while he was interviewing the Spaldings, he had been excommunicated while he wasn't there to defend himself for unchristian conduct with the female sex, clarified by Sidney Rigdon. So you could see how somebody could pull something out of that with like, oh, does that mean he had sex with someone? Nope. It was clarified by Sidney Rigdon, who officiated the trial, that he was kicked out for using obscene language to a young lady who was a member of the church. So you have, remember, Garrett, Garrett you you know better than this like you're, you're just lying to us you're just saying like don't trust this guy he's uh he's freaking darth vader over here if you really want to know what's true about all these anti-mormons and their arguments that have been repeated since mormonism unveiled are you really going to trust a twice excommunicated you know adulterer garrett we can we can watch this we can get this stuff leaked we can correct you like you don't need to say these lies to people put these ideas in their head so uh Hurlbut appealed to the council of the high priests and the council rescinded its decision. Uh, he later claimed he only pretended to seek reinstatement so he could gather more information about the church. So he gets back in and then he's like, well, now I know the Book of Mormon is not true. Now I know that you guys are full of crap. Let's go, MFers. Um, two days later, a general council heard testimony from several faithful Mormon men that they heard Hurlbut brag about having deceived Joseph Smith's God or the spirit by which he was actuated and excommunicated once again in his absence. Hurlbut then collected donations as he delivered anti-Mormon lectures in Kirtland and raised money to obtain affidavits showing the bad character of Joseph Smith's family. Hurlbut traveled to Palmyra and stayed for over a month lecturing and collecting statements from the Smith's family's uh, family's neighbors, as well as about the character of Martin Harris, where he asked each person to swear to their statement as truthful, signed them, and many were notarized. Anything you want to say up to that, Bill? Um, Dirk Mott, in his talk, presents it as if there is this critic, this club of critics who seek out uh, Hurlbut to uh, essentially send him on a mission to collect these things. And as you're seeing from Dan Fogel's words, it, it actually works in reverse exactly. where Hurlbut is wanting to go after Mormonism. He goes door to door. There's no such thing as a club of ex-Mormons. There's no such thing as a, a, a group of critics who are banded together by, uh, you know, whatever it is that makes them some kind of cohesive group. 
in the in the early uh, 1800s. And so Hurlbut is going door to door going like, I know something's not right here. And I'm going to start to collect money to see if I can go back and put together this story. It, it just is being told. Again, Dirk Mott is assuring you that he's the historian throughout this talk. He's right. assuring you that he's more credentialed and more qualified to address this issue than us, the critics. And when you read the TikToker, the TikTokers, I'm, 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 we're absolutely owning you right now, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I, I so can read, you, we can read this, dude. Yeah, sorry, go on. No, 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 you're good. When you read Vogel's uh, commentary and he straightens out the story, you begin to realize that Dirk Mott is uh, being deceiving. He's a historian. He does know these stories. He's, he's telling you as a historian, but he's telling the stories deeply and accurately and people should pick up on that. Thank you. Exactly. Cause again, yes, he does set himself as the authority as a historian and you're going to hear like, just because just something has a meme posted on Instagram doesn't mean it's true. Oh, thank you. Genius. We already know that no meme out there. <laughs> Is absolutely true but you know sometimes people can say things and you can look up the reference to it or you can uh you know follow up with your own information i never expect anyone to completely take my word for anything so i'm like absolutely find the sources that double check all of this stuff um because so i famously um just famously got notoriety on tiktok for i don't know just doing saying stuff on the internet and people liked what i had to say and Thankfully, I know how to read a book <laughs> and explain it back to people. It doesn't take, he's, he's acting like, uh, he says later in this that, uh, that even if somebody is a PhD trained historian, they still don't know everything. They still could have their hands in the archives and they still won't know everything. Everything will be testified to you by the Holy Spirit. It's like, well, whew, that's a high standard. That's a real high bar that this uh, God set for everyone because uh, we have some writings to the contrary and we all would like to have access to uh, to knowing truth here. So uh, It is such so, a big uh, difference, isn't it? Being caught in some form of adultery and speaking derogatory to a female. Like Those are two very, very different, different things. Very different things. Very different. I wish, Joseph Smith, if you spoke derogatory which you probably did to Emma a lot. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that, that, that would be nice. That'd be great. Um, so Benjamin Saunders was an associate of the Smiths and said that Hurlbut had a specific kind of testimony in mind that he couldn't get from him. So Hurlbut went to other people who are more hostile witnesses of Smith's character. If Hurlbut was guilty of choosing biased witnesses and ignoring favorable ones in any case, none of them ever redacted or corrected their statements. Some researchers concluded for this reason and others that the affidavits have to be considered on balance and credible. While Hurlbut's assumptions were wrong about the Solomon's bonding manuscript leading to the creation of the Book of Mormon, the witnesses' statements dealing with the Smith family themselves have held up through time. The neighbors' testimonies are overwhelmingly critical of the family's intemperance, money digging, neglect of their farm, and it doesn't mean their observations are untrue. There is also corroborating evidence and statements from believers in Joseph Smith as well. So I think that's a good Dan Vogel explanation where it's we're cutting right down the middle yeah I'm trying to have a vogel, balanced approach here vogel notes that while we ought to recognize that hurlbut and eber d howe that they exclude certain folks from collecting affidavits from because those folks were too positive so we don't get the full story mm -hmm. but that what we do get we ought to trust as sincere from the people who gave it right on once back in Ohio, Hurlbut resumed his attacks on Joseph Smith in public meetings, now armed with the affidavits which he read from. The bitterness of Hurlbut's criticisms resulted in Joseph Smith complaining to the Justice of the Peace, and the judge said uh, he was urged by the Mormons to take action. A preliminary hearing was held, and Joseph wrote in his journal, My soul delighteth in the law of the Lord, for he forgiveth my sins and will confound my enemies. The Lord shall destroy him who was lifted his heel against me, even that wicked man, Dr. P. Horlbutt. He will deliver him to the fowls of heaven, and his bones shall be cast to the best of the wind, for he lived his arm against the Almighty, therefore the Lord shall destroy him. So on one hand, the judge is like, okay, all the no Mormons are annoying me. And they say that Hurlba is just criticizing him. There's no evidence that he actually said, I'm going to kill you. But, you know, 
fair enough. He's, he's criticizing you. He's got all these affidavits and stuff, but then you have Joseph who, who feels like he has the mantle of God where he's like, mm, like <laughs> telekinesis is going to kill him. <laughs> like, it's like, okay, that's, that's go ahead, Bill. Um, to know that Joseph Smith is speaking independently here and that he seems to be speaking very much in his scriptural language, um, which he shouldn't be here. He is just, uh, he's just sharing his frustration uh, but it sounds very much like a chap a chapter and verse out of Moroni or something out of the DNC. Yeah, because you could somebody could sneak in his house, rip that journal out of it, and be like, see what Joseph said about me, you know? Like that sounds pretty threatening. So the court found that the complaint against Hurlbut had grounds and he might wound, beat, or kill Joseph or destroy his property and set bail at two hundred dollars and charge Hurlbut to keep the peace. The legal entanglements dissuaded Hurlbut from publishing the affidavits on his own, and an agreement was reached with Edie Howe to sell his evidence to him for publishing his own book, Mormonism Unveiled. Hurlbut was only a researcher, not a writer. Of the two hundred and ninety pages of Mormonism Unveiled, his research occupied only forty. So again, uh, um, Dirk Bot spent a lot of time. I, I edited this thing down. It's, it's down in my comment section though. Uh, but he spends a lot of time defaming <laughs> this robot guy. It's like, bro, he just was collecting affidavits. You can talk about something else. And he just wanted to call him. He just wanted to out him as a as an adulterer that he wasn't even that he was even that. And I was like, these arguments are so weak. Oh my gosh. So Edie Howe penned a letter to Professor Charles Anthon, if you remember from the beginning, the Egyptian, uh, who had seen the alleged specimen of writing of the golden plates, asking him about Martin Harris's statement that when Martin, this is like so gossip girl, that when Martin visited with the professor, he pronounced the transcript a genuine sample of reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics. And Anton's like, nah, uh, uh. He's like, I emphatically said that the facsimile shown to me, like they contained anything but Egyptian hieroglyphs, like step off size. Okay. And so despite this denial, Joseph Smith repeated that the famed linguist, Charles Anton, had pronounced the sample of characters from the golden plates to be true characters and the translation more correct than any that Anton had before seen translated from Egyptian. Web of lies. Did you guys follow that? Web of lies. So Howe's book. So you've got, you've got Edie Howe, newspaper editor, didn't like Mormons moving into his town, gets uh, Hurlbut's affidavits, puts them in Mormonism unveiled, asks um, the professor about like, what are all these things with the Egyptian? And he's like, bull crap. He's like, good to know. So Howe's book, Mormonism unveiled, was released in November 1834 and denounced by Smith loyalists as satanically inspired. That's what I got for right there. So that's my presentation on Mormonism Unveiled, which, by the way, if you want to actually get into it, most of the affidavits have to do with Joseph's money digging and all those neighbors being like, duh. So that's my two sentences on what they said. Did we ever, was there anything in there ever about the second adultery the very next day after being reinstated? Mm -hmm. I didn't see anything from Vogel. Oh, nope. Nope. The, uh, I read it. I read it four times. <laughs> Um, yeah. No, it just was that he was had whispers that he people overheard him that he was like, I just I actually don't want to be in this church because he did. He let he he was already ready to leave when he got excommunicated because he's like, this book is obviously derivative. And I told Joseph Smith, he knows that if I find out that he didn't write it, I'm totally going to destroy him. So he was on his way to peace out anyway. But I do believe that it was customary that you have to be able to be at your excommunication trial. And so I think the church was like, okay, we kind of like, we're a little swift about that. We heard you were swearing at some lady. We got mad. All right, we'll rescind that. You can be back in the church. He's like, I already don't know that. I already know your church isn't true anyway. So um, gets back in people over here that he's just there to collect information and they kick him out again. So so Dermot, you know that, like he knows that he's read this like history. He, he should have, or else he's not really a good historian if he hasn't read Mormonism yeah. Unveiled. And he makes fun of me for being a TikToker because what we say can't be taken seriously. I'm like, did I not just read and follow the bibliography? Like, anyway. The, yeah, the very first case he claims as adultery, we clearly see was something else. And the second case doesn't show up in the historical record that we could find. Exactly. Hmm. Well. And you'd think that that would be, there's nothing besides Joseph Smith saying that that's what happened. But like I said, the Sidney Rigdon, who was the officiant of the excommunication, clarified. And he said he was swearing at one of our church members and she was like, 
get him out of here. Mm -hmm. That's what Sidney Richardson said. So that seems right. dishonest. What the freak, dude? Okay, yeah. All right. Next clip. And sometimes it's it's tempting for us to to come to the conclusion that well, because there are so many arguments against Joseph Smith. Well, then there must be some truth to the fact that maybe he wasn't uh, a prophet of God. But if we were to apply that same standard to the Savior of all mankind, what was Jesus most often accused of in the Bible? He was most often accused of either being possessed by the devil or being the devil. So when someone wants to say, well, there wouldn't be so many negative things said about him if, if some of it wasn't true. Well, Jesus actually gives us a demonstration that actually that can absolutely be the case. <laughs> So Christians, sound off your, your comments on that, comparing Joseph Smith when people question things that happened 200 years ago versus your Lord and Savior. I would love to hear from Christians on that one. Um, but that one is just a train wreck in the face of a logical fallacy to me. What do you think, Bill? So let's start with Jesus. The reason Jesus was persecuted was because he was going after the leaders within his own religious system. So if we're going to compare anybody to Jesus in the way that Dirk Mott is suggesting, it would need to be the critics that Joseph Smith and the church went after and got rid of. Folks like um, uh, William Law, uh, William Marks by Brigham Young after the death of Joseph Smith, like any insider in the church who's raising a voice of criticism and Joseph Smith or Brigham Young in the top leadership, get rid of that person. That would be the more uh, equitable comparison to Jesus because he was criticizing the leaders within his Jewish faith while he was a participating Jew. Right on. And uh, it's always, you're getting really sticky territory when um, Jesus, you know, we, we have some, some conflicting evidence about the things he said. I don't always think that the four gospels are really that, uh, helpful. You know, Christians will be like, are we so grateful that we have four records of, of Jesus's life? And then you get into the sticky contradictions of the situation and compare that to the contradictions of the different accounts of the first vision. So as time goes by, you're, you're on, you're overall in some sticky, sticky territory there, but it's funny the way that I feel like apologists, they want to have their cake and eat it too. You know, if you're in a chapel, you're going, just like his talk right now, you're going to have um, Joseph Smith right at like the right hand of God, <laughs> that he is just so um, held up as this um, amazing prophet of the restoration spiritual leader. And then the more that you learn about Joseph Smith, you're like, Okay, well, he's 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 not quite like Christ like I thought that he was. There's about 200 different items of the ways that he's not like Christ. And so just to compare that to Jesus Christ, who overall was like, you know what? Hens or foxes have holes. Birds have nests. I'm the son of God. I have nowhere to lay my head. And if you want to be a follower of me, you got to abandon all of your money and, and uh, come follow me and stuff. And Joseph's like, well, I'm starting a bank. And also I am king of the world. And I'm opening up a tavern and for you to get into heaven, I'm going to need your wife and or daughter to have sexual relations with ships with. So it's the most apples and oranges comparison I could ever think of, honestly. And it fails to take in, if you're really going to have an out in the open conversation about this particular segment, you'd have to compare Joseph Smith to other people like L. Ron Hubbard or Warren Jeffs. And you would have to go like, Oh, yeah. like, Maybe there's things Joseph Smith is doing that aren't healthy that also have very good comparisons with other really unhealthy uh, religious uh, founders or gurus or zealots Excellent. Uh, in modern religion. Excellent point. Uh, all right. Back at it. I think if I go like this, we'll do that one. I don't have the time to go through all of the great things Joseph Smith has, has, has helped restore to the world, but I do want to at least try to answer this question. Why does Joseph Smith matter? Frankly, there are, uh, I would guess, some members who wish that they didn't have to, to deal with Joseph Smith. They want to just, you know, they want to just believe what they believe and believe the Book of Mormon, but I don't know about Joseph Smith being a prophet, that kind of thing. But the, the primary reason why it matters, the reason why we talk about it so much, the reason why we have, you know, firesides where softball players who lost a bet have to come and, and speak and, and spend your Sunday evening is because Jesus Christ lives. 
The primary thing we get from Joseph is a personal, repeated, overwhelming witness that Jesus Christ indeed lives in a world that is continually foundering in doubt as more and more people leave Christianity and leave religion altogether in places like the United States. Joseph Smith's testimony is, hey, we're not talking about what happened 2,000 years ago. It's 200 years ago, not even, that Jesus repeatedly appeared to, spoke to, and gave revelations to the prophet Joseph Smith. I'd like to focus a little bit on some of those things, some of the teachings that we would have that we wouldn't have otherwise without Joseph. I would also like to focus on those things, if I may. <laughs> Please comment section and live stream and Bill Reel. I have just collected a couple of the teachings that we have that we wouldn't have without Joseph Smith. Please chime in yours. These are just rattled off the top of my head. Some of them I also took from, again, Mike from LDS Discussions. Um, so uh, there's the faith-promoting ones. Sure, sure. There's the ones that you're going to say without context. There's a lot... Uh, there's obviously, so God, God wanted his most correct book of scripture to be used to find the golden plates and translate the book of Mormon, going to be the keystone of the religion, using the very same stone that Joseph claimed to see buried treasure with, that, that God, we know because of Joseph that God calls prophets who claim they can see lost or buried objects without actually ever retrieving anything, yet still replicate those methods to produce his scripture. Thanks, Joseph. Um, that Adam and Eve must be his, a historical story that occurred 6,000 years ago for the Book of Mormon to be true against all DNA and archaeological evidence. The global flood must have cleared off the Americas for the Jaredites to find it against all the evidence that there was no such event and that the Tower of Babel must be a literal event for the interpreters to have been created for the Jaredites. Now we know that's how God operates. Thanks for that stuff, Joseph. Adam and Eve must have been in the Garden of Eden in Missouri, which again is contradicted by every piece of evidence imaginable that shows that humans first came out of Africa. <laughs> Thanks for that, Joseph. That the real Egyptian language, fascinating. Did you guys know the real Egyptian language is unknown to us today for the book of Abraham to be right? Everything we learned from the Rosetta Stone has to be wrong. So now we know that from Joseph. Unless we create deniable plausibility by adding in a catalyst theory. And the only reason we invented a catalyst theory is because once we had the scrolls, it didn't match up. So we had to come up with another way to reconcile it. And oh that God. way requires added conjecture and allowances. Yep. Which you never, Joseph never said that. It's just so interesting. Going off of what Joseph said, was he like, the, he was beaming stuff down, like, God is telling him. He's, Abraham getting, written he's got by revelations. He's got some revelations, except for when we get them. And now we're, we've got whispers in a back room about how to fudge this. Yeah. How do people, Mormons, did you hear what I just said? If there's a faithful Mormon watching right now, like how that, I never, ever will get over the book of Abraham and the apologetics on mm -hmm. it. It is insane. Like I said, there literally can't be a real Egyptian language. Do you hear me right now? There can't be a real Egyptian language because Joseph said he was writing in this re reformed Egyptian that has nothing to do with Egyptian. That must mean we don't know Egyptian. God re would reveal the word of wisdom by Joseph that was lifted directly from the temperance movement and neglected to tell members to boil water, which would have saved over a dozen lives, you know, just probably thousands of lives if they could give that information out to the world on pamphlets um, in the early church from cholera. So, um, God, God cares more about you not having just hot drinks. The, the temperature of your beverage, very important to God. Then God really sent an angel down to threaten Joseph Smith to start marrying and having sex with women. Uh, that's what we know from Joseph Smith. Joseph says that's the kind of God. Again, big picture stuff. What do we learn from Joseph Smith? That's the kind of God he's telling you exists, that he has a, a this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal love of men. Sounds great, God. What are the things you want to tell me? Well, sometimes I'm going to make sure that angels with flaming swords come down and threaten my prophets to have sex with teenagers. I don't know about that plan of yours anymore. I don't feel super comfortable with it. Well, too bad. That the modern studies of evolution, DNA, linguistics, archaeology, and so on have all been wrong and Joseph Revolutions had it right, you know? So um, that's what we got. Oh, my other favorite one. <laughs> and last but not least. <laughs> In the beginning, God gave Adam a language that was pure, perfect, and undefiled. This Adamic language 
uh, now unknown was far superior to any tongue, which is presently extant. So that word Bruce R. McConkie Mormon doctrine. So there you have um, Mormon leadership in the 20th century, also doubling down on something that is wholesale, insane, false. The earth, Adam did not live 6,000 years ago, but he's, Dirk Mott is trying to say here that we get so many things from Joseph Smith. If you question the character of Joseph Smith, you pay attention to all of these attacks going back to this twice a excommunicated adulterer. You're going to be giving up so much, giving up what? Like giving up the, he's, he's in this interview and he's asked what's the pure, uh, the God's pure language. Awem. What's the name of the son of God, son of Awem. What are the angels called in the pure language? He's like phoning this in. <laughs> He's like rolled over and just like, I don't know, like Almond Ainslands. Joseph Smith has copied down the periodomic language. That's the kind of stuff you get from Joseph Smith. So don't let uh, talks like dirt moths fool you that like these, the doctrines of Mormonism are so unique. They're not. There's, there's so many other beautiful, more uh, enveloping ways of uh, viewing spirituality. And uh, Mormonism has some, has some, has some nice ones. I had a good time in it. Um, but overall, don't think that that just because Joseph Smith, you will only know Jesus Christ and you will only be able to have, you know, this loving, eternal connection with a higher power. It's it's anything but. It's uh, subscribing yourself to a very authoritarian system where your feelings and thoughts are on the lowest of the totem pole. And that just isn't, that's not going to be, per I want the best for you guys. I want the best for you, babe. That's not it. Yeah. The, the only thing I'll add here, if he, he says he doesn't have enough time to go into what Joseph Smith gave us, if we take the things we really do sort of like, and let's say we like things like the pre-earth life, or we like, uh, um, we like, I do have this clip. I do have the clip of him talking about that stuff, by the way. Sweet. I, I just want to acknowledge that whatever those things are, there's a conversation that needs to be had about Emanuel Swedenborg, about some of the books that were written that, uh, very much of, of Joseph Smith's day. So Emanuel Swedenborg is a theologian uh, who prior to Joseph Smith's life is plotting out things like three kingdoms of glory. There are contemporary books of Joseph Smith's day that lay out a very similar word of wisdom, dietary guidelines. Uh, Adam Clark's commentary is another book that we now know Joseph Smith had in his possession. There are lots of uh, doctrinal connections that are found in Adam Clark's commentary. So even when we talk about the good things that Joseph Smith gave us, we have to be willing to ask, is it possible that he got those from contemporary sources? And then he says, like, what impact this would have that we have a modern witness in the last 200 years rather than 2000 years ago. But notice how that argument loses its flavor in another 2000 years. And also yeah. notice um, it doesn't make any difference. In other words, the world isn't converted to Mormonism. Only 0.2% of the world are Mormons. Mm -hmm. Only 35% of that point two are active. And among the active ones, whether they believe in a pre-earth life or the word of wisdom or whatever, it really doesn't have any impact. There's just people going to church on Sunday and whatever church they go to, they're experiencing so similar sorts of experiences. And the Mormon God makes room for all of them to be saved in the highest kingdom of glory anyway. Right. Um, well said, I, uh, I just, I want to come back to this at the end cause we're going to address this, but Stacy, don't think that we don't see your comment that my mother-in-law said that Justin Smith couldn't have had sex with the women because there aren't any children from DNA with him. We had a huge hype with her about it. Um, we will come back to that cause he, he actually addresses that in the Q and a section. So stay tuned. All right. Uh, well done, Bill. Um, anything else you want to say to this? All right. Often I'm asked to, to meet with people who are really struggling with aspects of church history and it's, it's affected their testimony. And, and those are often heartrending conversations and, and difficult experiences. But rarely when I meet with uh, people who are struggling in their faith like that, have they fully contemplated what it is they're giving up if they give up Joseph Smith as a prophet? First, that witness that, that Jesus is the Christ, that modern day witness that Jesus is the Christ. Secondly, though, that we all lived before we came here. The doctrine of the pre-mortal life, which is spelled out in the book of Abraham and the book of Moses and in multiple revelations of Joseph Smith, is not a Christian doctrine. Christians don't believe that. Latter-day Saints believe that. We believe it because the prophet Joseph Smith revealed it. All other Christians believe that you were created 
moment of conception, sometimes maybe at the moment of birth, but in either case, you have no pre-existence. You were created by God at the moment of your birth, essentially. We believe that we have immortal spirits that were immortal before we came to this world. We believe that because we kept our first estate, everyone, essentially everyone who's ever lived in this world is going to eventually go to heaven. Now, a level of heaven. I don't, I don't know what that is or how judgment will work, but that idea that every single person has an equal opportunity, and not just if they were so lucky that they were born into a Christian world or with Christian parents, but Joseph's going to reveal another controversial doctrine, like baptism for the dead. Which All right, let me pause it there because he just said so many things that are just, there's a big tangly thing. And um, I'm sorry to brag, but I do a lot of reading and I really want to be able to not straw man Mormon's theology. I was Mormon for a long time. I can think of how I understood things, how it's taught now versus how it used to be taught. So there's just so many things that are taught about Mormon salvation. Do you agree, Bill? It is very hard to get a pinned down answer uh, like to about the atonement and how things work. And like he just said, he's like, I don't know how it's all going to work. And that is a really key thing about a Mormon apologetics is they want to give you this feeling like, well, doesn't it feel good to know that you're, that you lived in heaven with your father and that you can return to live with your family. And they're going to kind of push the emotion to the forward. Well, the words that they're actually saying are, I don't actually know how any of this works and everyone's going to be saved. And, uh, and then you, you, you add in the other things that are just undeniable that Joseph's, uh, his theology changed over time, which I think Dermot, he, he does admit to that a little bit right here. And, but that's, that's an important thing to know. It's like, you're, you're putting so much weight on that. This, this prophet is a testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, what about the first vision? Did he see like God or Jesus or whatever? Can he not ask him to clarify some things from time to time? And he's like a testimony of Jesus Christ that he's another witness just 200 years ago, but can we get any more answers about his nature, his character, his atonement? And it's always changing. Joseph's theology is always changing over time. And so my one thing I want to say to Mormon apologists, if Mormon defender is ever out there, it is not the things that Dirtma is in this is, that is trying to say like, well, you're just worried because you didn't know. And I'm a historian. And if you studied this for 20 years, you'd know it too. It's not that it is the insidious way that Joseph changed his theology over time and that their fingerprints of Joseph Smith all over it, Jesus Christ, not so much. So. Yeah. If, if you read the book of Mormon theology as printed in the first edition of the book of Mormon, and then compare it to like the King Follett sermon or compare it to sections of the DNC or compare it to the lectures on faith, you'll find that theology doesn't, not only changes, it contradicts. So the idea right. of what God is or what the Holy Ghost is differs substantially when you go to the lectures on faith compared to the Book of Mormon. Um, also, just to say again, how does knowing there was a pre-earth life actually help me? Am I, am I happier? Am I, am I a better Christian disciple if I believe in the pre-earth life? Do Does my... <laughs> opportunity to be exalted go up if I believe in a pre-earth life. And so the reality is like, oh, it's cool to have this extra belief, but what does it actually function and do for somebody? And when you look around and compare Mormons with their activity rates, their happiness rates, um, and Mormon theology around everyone else in the world having a chance to be saved and other people outside the church and their happiness and activity rates, we don't really find it to be drastically different humans, human, and which beliefs they have that make them enthusiastic doesn't really matter as long as the belief makes them enthusiastic. Yeah, that's such a good point. Yeah. Cause he's putting out all of these things and it's like, well, wh like what is actually advantageous about yeah. that? It's just different. And then they always want to stay within the paradigm of Christianity. And it's like, there's so many religions and so many venues of spirituality and secularism. And I, I know Bill, you're the first person to introduce me to like Eckhart Tolle. And I'm like, I'm like vibing way over here with mindfulness. By the way, Rebecca said, uh, the ideas of pre-mortal life and eternal life after death put me in a place of not ever living in the present. And not to be confused with like living for the moment, like, you know, YOLO or whatever. It's it's Eckhart Tolle. It's, uh, it's mindfulness. It's uh, actually uh, feeling your feelings and so many other wonderful things. But yeah, um, I just think that that is... A whole bunch of gobbledygook, and uh, I'm going to press play now. Anything else? Yeah.
Knuckles. Thanks, Knuckles. Love your podcast. Helps me not be bored at work. Yay. Super chats are so welcome. I appreciate it. This really is like my job. And I put a lot of research into this video. And Bill is just also my favorite. So I'm just happy to be doing this. But thanks. Any donations are welcome. I also have a donor box and Patreon. Venmo. Links below. Um, Back at it. Is it controversial to you? Nope. I got to push that. This button. I would guess none of you have ever been sitting on the edge of your bed crying, saying, like, I don't know. I mean, if God provided a way for everyone to be saved, there's no way this church is true. Right? I, it's not been a tough thing for you. But when Joseph first revealed it, incredibly controversial. Um, actually, this. that's not true, by the way. Did you know that? <laughs> I did hey, a little bit of research on that. And, I was um, laughing at his, <laughs> his little act there. What, what was he saying? He was saying that when these the idea because uh, they were going from a predestination uh, fire and brimstone type of yeah. like God hates you version of Christianity and that Joseph's introducing the baptism for the dead. And he's like, Joseph introduced that. Nobody else had that. That's unique to us. And I know it's not controversial for you because that's such a wonderful doctrine. You're not at the edge of your bed crying about it, but for and back in his day, very controversial. Um, and that's just, again, the, you, 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 we can read the writings of the day. We can know what was being said. We can pull every single, I would say, uh, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong. I could probably in my research and documents and just everything I've read and written, I could connect every single freaking revelation of Joseph Smith's to a direct event in his life, a direct conversation, something in a newspaper where that was in the milieu of his day, just like we did our other video about the plagiarisms. And so for, for Joseph to say, Oh, it's just so painful for, for apologists like this to say that, that Joseph came up with this very unique doctrine that proves he's a prophet. Don't you love this doctrine? Well, by the same token, you have Joseph Smith only had a few revelations and doctrines that he put forward. And one of them is the book of Moses, as I think it's chapter seven, it's the curse of Cain. That's something that was in Joseph's milieu at the day. A lot of people were wondering, why do people have dark skin? Is it because they sinned? Is it the curse of Cain? What is this about? And Joseph's like, Yes, God said it actually is the curse of Cain. I'm going to put that in our scriptures. Make sure everyone knows that. Like very few <laughs> things that, that that Joseph actually spent time writing about and put into doctrine. And that's one of them. That's one of the horrendous things that Joseph Smith spent time working on. And so for him to say like, I know you don't spend a lot of time worrying that everyone's going to be saved. First of all, the theology of, of Mormonism and salvation is very complicated as I'm about to get into because you have a lot of fire and brimstone. You have a lot of people have religious trauma for good reason because they do feel like they're going to be separated from their family. And what is that if it's not hellish torment being told that you're the empty seat at the table? So it's not all just like happiness and rainbows or else the church wouldn't have like something to club you with to get you to stay in line, obviously. But there's just there's obviously things that Joseph revealed that have long-term ramifications that come with us. And to paint this, it's so disingenuous, so disingenuous to say, well, I'm sure you're not worried about this. Yeah, dude, we're not worried about that as much, but that's just something that was around in his day. It wasn't super unique. No one else was, was around in his day that super wasn't unique. Freaking racism. And he put that in the scriptures. You don't see just like regular old preachers doing that in his day that has ramifications all the way to 2013 when it's finally disavowed and people have a reason to stop standing up in Sunday school and saying, oh, I don't like interracial marriage. Like these are long-term ramifications from Joseph Smith. Yeah. I'll add, he mentions baptisms for the dead or work for the dead there directly. Um, people should be aware that again, our theological basis that we've used since our inception was the idea of either 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 15, verse 29, else what shall they do who are baptized for the dead, for the dead exactly. rise not at all. When you look at that uh, verse, it always struck me as it was sort of saying the opposite, meaning that these were heretics who were teaching a false idea and Paul or whoever the author is of Corinthians is essentially going like, here are these heretics and they're teaching this thing and it's not, it's not actually acceptable. And in recent months, the BYU, uh, the Maxwell Institute came out with a new book called Ancient Christians. That book is trying to inform the average believing Mormon to give them a more well-rounded analysis of early Christianity. And that book is shooting down so many concepts that we taught around the great apostasy and around how we got the doctrines that we did. 
trying to suggest that we got them from the New Testament or got them from the Old Testament. And they're basically saying like, it's way messier than that. But one of the exact, one of the direct points they make is that it does seem in fact, as if that scripture on baptism for the dead is a later creation in Christianity by heretics. And hence we ought to be very cautionary in connecting that scripture to the church's own practice for work for the dead. Mm, it feels like an inside scoop. It feels like tabloid, like, Ooh, juicy goss. <laughs> it's a great book. And it That's shoots great. down Mormon uh, doctrine left and right, almost on every page. Ooh. All right. Shall I continue? Also, thanks, George. Super chats are so nice. We love you, Nuance Ho. Bill, you too. Fight the good fight. Thank you, George Washington. Hey, Duke. Amazing. Standard Reformed Christian theology in Joseph Smith's time. That almost every single person was going to go to hell. And every person deserved to go there. And if God chose to save just a few people, praise God, he shouldn't save anybody. Talking about those who go for the telestial kingdom, it kind of sounds a little bit at first like Reformed Christian theology. These are they who are liars and sorcerers and adulterers and whoremongers and whosoever loves and makes a lie. These are they who suffer the wrath of God on earth. These are they who suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. These are they who are cast down to hell and suffer the wrath of Almighty God. You know, preach, brother. This sounds pretty good. So far, Jonathan Edwards and Joseph, right there. Here's the greatest, you know, uh, until in theological history. They're going to suffer the wrath of Almighty God until the fullness of times. So, Bill, if you can help me, I was researching this way past my bedtime last night, and I am like, are they just picking words that sound good? Because in my mind in Mormonism, like, you you leave your body on earth, and there's people who accepted the gospel are going to go to spirit paradise, and then people in spirit prison, and then they're going to wait for the millennium for Jesus to come back. Jesus will judge everyone for their works and then divide them into their their degrees of glory. And then even the celestial kingdom will be like, so great. You'd want to kill yourself. But the people who are really going to have a hard time is the sons of perdition is the people who were apostatized from the church and they get to go and time out for forever. And that's more what these scriptures are talking about. Correct me if I'm wrong, that like that hellfire wrath stuff, that that is not, it's not just the whoremongers and not just the liars and sorcerers. That's really saved for the sons of perdition in outer darkness. That's how I understand Mormon theology, that all of those really harsh words are saved for apostates. Yeah. yeah. He has this conversation as if when he talks about hell, it's, it's this very depressing, unenjoyable theology that if you're forced to believe that in your mortal life, you you're worse off than the Mormons who have eternal families and have kingdoms of glory Right. But you're pointing out one, you're pointing out that outer darkness is comparable to hell in the Christian world. And so for any of us who lose our testimonies in the church, once you're in, you can't get out because once you get out, you're outer darkness and it's just as bad as hell. Number one. Number two is that he poses this idea that, um, that being in one of the three kingdoms of glory means you're going to be happier in this life, knowing that you're going to have for uh, almost a guaranteed happiness in the next but that doesn't seem to match the data about how often depression medicine is used in Utah, uh, how much anxiety in Utah people have, uh, how prevalent sex abuse in Utah is. Uh, it also goes a long way to say that, yes, the celestial kingdom is so much better than this place, but you also won't have your family. You won't be visited by God and Jesus. And so as you sit back and go like, oh, if I don't bust my ass in this Mormon thing and pay all my tithing and go to the temple and do my ministering servants and carry out my calling, go to all my meetings and show up for the move on Saturday morning, then I'm going to end up in a lower kingdom. And if I yeah. end up in a lower kingdom, I'm miserable anyway, because my wife and my kids are over there. My parents are over there. Uh, exaltations over there. And so you can, it could be the most beautiful place in the world. But if I'm lonely and not with the people that I love and miss, it doesn't really make much difference. Exactly. And uh, quick shout out, Sarah asked if, Kara, is this a wine mom Jared shirt? Yes. Samantha Shelley's boyfriend makes the coolest shirt. J winemomjared.com. It's a free plug. Um, he gave me the shirt for my birthday last week. Um, missed nice. you at my party, Bill. Anyway, um, <laughs> it was a rager. On John Dolan was there and Margie. Anyway, nice. um, I just got to fulfill my lifelong dream of having 40 of my favorite people in my, in my house dancing. So I came to the last um, one. 
<laughs> I know. He builds a party animal. Um, so yeah, there's just this, I only add this. So what should be, we be grateful that Joseph revealed that God's plan is for no one to have to suffer in hell like the Protestants did. That's, that's what he's kind of getting at here. And obviously Joseph Smith's theology evolved over the course of his life and his views on hell are no exception. In his early teachings, Joseph Smith subscribed to a traditional Christian view of hell as a place of eternal punishment for the wicked. Eternal. Again, when, when you're knowing that you're using metaphorical languages, that's helpful. But when you're telling people about their freaking salvation and use the word eternal, don't throw that word around of eternal torment. Like this is serious stuff. If that, if you're just saying eternal, but what, what dirt Ma is saying, it's not eternal. It's just, you're just going to live with your, I did a bunch of reading on this last night. And basically his argument is like, you're going to live knowing that your sins are bad until the resurrection. And then you're going to get to go to the happy, happy bottom celestial kingdom. That's still so great. You'd want to kill yourself, but you're still going to have to be like racked with all this anger. So it's either eternal torment or it's not like you got to really clarify. So in uh, DNC 19 and surely every man must repent or suffer for I, God am endless, eternal, endless. Do those words not mean what I thought that they meant? Wherefore, I revoke not the judgments which I shall pass, but woes shall go forth, weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, yea, to those who are found on my left hand, which, as we know, is the inferior hand. The dirty hand. <laughs> Nevertheless, it is not written that there shall be no end to this torment, but it is written endless torment. So you've heard that there could be an end to it? Wrong. Again, it is written eternal damnation. Sounds like Thank hell. you, DNC19. <laughs> Yeah. So again, Dirtmont is trying to play this whole thing of like Joseph Smith revealed something so contradictory to what we was saying. Doesn't that prove he was a prophet? Isn't that so nice that he has this hell that's good, that's just not actually that bad and, and everyone's going to get saved? It actually reveals that he was just making stuff up as he was going along. Come on. All right. Yeah. His, uh, his quality. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, yeah, go for it. J just that. He's a historian with a specific field of Mormonism. If those, again, not that he believes differently than he's saying, who knows? But if he believes differently than he's saying, he can't really afford to lose his job. He can't. He's paid by the church to do Mormon history. If he's not doing that, I would love to hear what he thinks his potential is in the secular world outside of the church. Mm hmm. Joseph teaches that yes, people are going to suffer for their sins, but eventually everyone will have suffered enough that they're going to go to a kingdom of heaven. And now, we can eventually the and eternally are I mean, two different words. I mean, but we, we try to like, we don't want anyone to think they want to go there. Well, look, it's the default. We don't go anywhere else. But, um, but Joseph doesn't talk about it as some kind of terrible place. And thus we saw in the heavenly vision the glory of the celestial, which surpasses all understanding. And no man knows it except him to whom God has revealed it. You can't comprehend how great and glorious the celestial kingdom is. The he goes on to say that I'm authorized to say to you, my friends, in the name of the Lord, that you may wait for your friends to come forth to meet you in eternity in the morn of the celestial world. Those saints who have been murdered in the persecution shall triumph in the celestial world while their murderers shall dwell in torment until they pay the utmost farthing. Um, this, this theology was something that at first, even Brigham Young couldn't come to terms with. It was so opposite of everything he'd ever been taught that when he talked about it, he said, when that was first revealed, they came into contact with our own prejudices. Guess what I'm going to add here, Bill? I'll give you one guess of what I prepared to go right here. I don't know. Tell me. So again, he's setting this up as like, this is just so backwards that even Brigham Young had a hard time accepting that everyone will be saved. God loves everyone. We just, all that Protestant fire and brimstone, we're over that. This is the loving church. God loves you so much. Even Brigham Young, he had a hard time. He's like, he had a hard time reconciling it. But his point is literally that Brigham Young did. You liar. You absolute freaking liar. <laughs> no, he didn't. Because we know. Brigham Young accepted the doctrine that everyone would be saved and challenged his own biases. Hmm. That's interesting when compared to the fact that Brigham Young introduced the blood atonement for the church, where a person's blood had to be shed to atone for their sins. Hmm. Does it sound like to you, listeners, that Brigham Young was like, oh, Finally, a doctrine of love and repentance for everyone gets saved. Also, slitting our throats. Who wants to slit their throats? Shut the doors. Who called me? Not a real prophet. Let's murder them. These are contradictory ideas. And 
the fact that blood atonement exists and that Brigham Young introduced it. Who gave us the race ban that said that certain people couldn't enjoy the full blessings of exaltation? Um, that was Curse of Cain was, you know, the doctrine was Joseph Smith wrote it, but he still ordained black people into the church. Yeah. But yeah, Brigham Young was the one who's like, no, 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 no. We're heading out to Utah. Whites only. Yeah. But everybody um, gets saved in the celestial kingdom. If, if but they everyone do gets, all the things they're supposed to do. <laughs> but black people last. Um, according yeah. to Brigham Young, some of the sins that required blood atonement included murder, adultery, apostasy, and interracial marriage. Young taught that these sins were so serious that the only way to atone for them was for the sinner to willingly shed their blood or own blood or for someone else to shed their blood of the, on the sinner's behalf. He believed that it was necessary part of the law and those who refused to accept this doctrine would be damned. Damned to what, Brigham? I thought you you totally were like on board with like everyone being saved. You're just playing so silly right now. There's little evidence to suggest that blood atonement was actually practiced by the LDS Church or its members. However, there are a few instances in which that doctrine may have been invoked. For example, there are reports of members of the church being threatened with blood atonement for committing certain sins. There's also a few cases of individuals being executed for capital crimes in Utah during the mid-19th century, some of which were carried out by members of the LDS Church. Your girl researches shit, and she tells you, Dirt Mop, we're calling you out. Don't don't give us this narrative that Brigham Young is like he challenged his biases and you know what he came around. No, he didn't, and it's very obvious and calls into question his prophetic mantle and the mantle that we think we're so special today that we have the one true church carried over. Restoration, Brigham Young, keys to Joseph Smith, to Lorenzo Snow, all the way up to Russell M. Nelson. I'm gonna call bullshit. <laughs> that Brigham Young, Brigham Young actually, he never called himself a prophet, at least in the early days, right? He called himself, what was the title he gave himself, Bill? Uh-oh, I muted you. Why did it mute? No, I did that. I, he, one of oh, the things oh. he referred to himself was a Yankee guesser. And I'll also note there's a contradiction between the sinner willingly shedding their own blood and his threat of if he caught his wife in adultery, he'd have no problem throwing a javelin through the two of them. Uh, yeah. instantaneously killing them. And it doesn't seem like any kind of willing sacrifice. Mm -mm. Yeah. So it's just, again, this whole video is about sunlight makes the best disinfectant. You're going to have these closed rooms of what people like in my stake are hearing. Um, you're doubting your testimony, maybe a little bit. You heard some things about Joseph Smith, but you've got to just get on board that Joseph, he revealed so many important things. And even people like Brigham Young, who had their biases, he was like, wow, Joseph, you're so on board. The Holy Spirit has moved on me and I'm absolutely on board. And also this knife ain't going to murder people itself. So let's get to it. There's just so many contradictions. And when you add the full context of history and you just, you're able to get your hands on videos like this, you're like, Mormon apologists, what are you guys saying? You guys are, you guys are just lying, full, full face lying to people. I just want to one other thing, which is note that the critic, uh, you, me, all the other podcasters that are out there, we seem to be willing to sit down with that side. And have a conversation where we walk them through all of the complexity yeah. of this and ask questions that put them into a corner where they'll have to admit that things don't add up the way they think. Though that side of folks won't come near us generally. And when they do, they need a space to talk really kind of uh, surface level about these things. You'll find very rarely Jim Bennett being one, Patrick Mason being another, who will get into kind of the complexity of these issues but if you go listen to those i'd love to know out of a hundred every hundred people how which what percentage of people find which side to be the weaker argument because i think long-form conversations are not beneficial to the church or its theology mm -hmm. precisely there's no like top 10 thing times in history where any apologist has ever won an argument. They're all kind of mm -hmm. spinning with each other, trying to have better arguments, trying to do better than the evangelicals or a different religion. But the skeptics view, the, again, the Occam's razor, the most rational approach that has the least amount of conjecture is the one that most people are going to go to when they don't have, you know, different pillars of uh, their life depending on stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Back at it. Think and pray and read and think and pray and reflect until I knew and saw it for myself by the visions of the spirit. Those visions are weird. example of how Brigham Young dealt with what the prophet revealed that was totally opposed to what he thought. We live in a world where people want to follow prophets when those prophets just so happen to say the things 
that they already believe. When the prophet just so happens to say something that helps you win your political argument with your friend, when the prophet just so happens to say something that already comports with whatever social custom you have, well, then we're sharing that on Facebook as many times as we possibly can, trying to win our political and social arguments by means of whatever the prophet has said. But I would submit that the true test of discipleship is whether or not you share the talk that's opposed to what your political beliefs are. All right. Well, that just doesn't make any sense. Don't share something and say, I don't be- like, I would like go on Facebook and say like, Hey, um, there are some people who think that the election was stolen and here it is. Here's what they have to say on it. I'd be like, I just don't think the data supports that. And I just don't feel like furthering a narrative that the data, the data doesn't support. I think, I just think that's kind of a weird thing to say that makes him sound like he's like super intelligent, you know, where he's like, literally he's, he's, he's trying to, to push down the negativity of doing things where you uh, don't agree with something and you should find the other alternative answer of it. And that's what we're doing to you right now, Garrett. And we're, we're telling you that you have one idea, you have one narrative and we're trying to give people the opposing narrative. And it's just interesting that he's preaching what he doesn't practice. Just yeah. That and what he, what he describes is contradicted by the historical record. And here's what I mean. Um, He's suggesting that we ought to be open to prophets who say things that don't mesh with the way we'd want things to be. Brigham Young taught Adam God, and later prophets didn't like the way that it was, so they changed it. The very people he's criticizing could be easily labeled as the future prophet seers and revelators who follow Brigham Young. Boom. I didn't even think about that point. Thank you, Bill. Oh, uh, because he's saying prophets like as a, you know, metaphorical prophets. They say like, hard oh. things, get in line. And meanwhile, we have instances of LDS prophets saying things that were only disavowed and tossed out in the trash by future prophets because we didn't like what they said. Yeah, you only, up until like the the printing of the Joseph Smith papers, like you couldn't get, um, what came before the ensign? The, uh, um, so you know, the, just the church the publication. New, yeah, the was there the improvement friend, era, new era, improvement era. That's what yeah, it was called. Era. There you go. Just you know yeah. when the when the talks and stuff. Just so many of the the archives of the church are so inaccessible and stuff because I think if people were able to actually see, this is what a prophet mouthpiece of God said at one point, and it's always being taken and superseded by somebody else. Somebody might say they're not quite a prophet, quite a mouthpiece anymore, not quite a seer. Right. Um and um. Yeah, we don't just because I I just hate this apologetic argument. Can I just rant on one thing? It's just so low hanging fruit. Like you think that you're being an intellectual, like just because somebody says something on Facebook, just because your Uncle Joe had a comment about this doesn't mean it's true. Like, are you talking to a bunch of like fifth graders who are it's their first time on the Internet? Like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, um, you don't need to tell us that. Like, uh, hopefully people what you really should be telling us is like, what critical thinking looks like, what a logical fallacy looks like, like what good research looks like, how you compare it, how, what, what peer review means. Like, it's all about like, if they say it on Facebook, you know, it's like, that is the lowest of low. Like nobody cares. Anyway, I'm just, that's the most annoying thing he said to me personally. So that's where you really decide whether you're a follower of, of the prophet as he follows Jesus or whether there are other things that, that come in our way. And for Brigham, once he embraced that doctrine, it became his favorite doctrine. He talked about it all the really? time. Really? Oh, method. He, really? His favorite one. His literal His favorite, favorite one. one. I feel like holding a slave would be your favorite doctrine because you're like, I wrote that one. That one's my favorite because it helps me um, put castor oil up my ass for all of my daily enemas. So that's a fun fact, just in case you didn't know. He had slaves to give him uh, castor oil enemas. So, like, <laughs> there, there's, there's just, that's just an asinine His lie. His favorite like, one. Everyone's going to be saved. Everybody's gonna be saved. We're just talking about exaltation. But I'm always grateful that the reason why I believe in the resurrection is because of Joseph Smith. To me, Joseph Smith is essential to my testimony of Jesus because that's how I know that the Savior was resurrected. Joseph Smith saw and talked to him. And that means that all of us are going to have our lost loved ones again. But you often have people in your... Um, I just wanted to include that clip because... Uh, he goes on much longer than that. And he starts crying and he tells a story about his brother dying at a young age and that... God has a plan for us where we'll all be reunited and that he's going to pull everyone out of the graves. And um, it goes without saying that religions work 
uh, heavily to manipulate your emotions when logic and facts um, are kind of pushed more to the back burner because yes, we make a lot of our decisions sometimes based on emotional and impulses that make us feel good and feel in a community and make us feel like we have answers to big questions that those logic and facts won't answer. We can't answer exactly where we're going. And so this emotional pull is what he's putting in. So no Mormon talk, no Christian talk, no whatever religious talk is ever going to be complete without giving you a very sad story about how you lost a loved one, but you will see them again and make every single person in the audience get that elevated emotion and be like, you know what? I heard you spouting some bullshit earlier, but you know, I, I really do want to see my family again. True. True. I will continue wearing these garments. I will continue putting things on the shelf because I do want to keep my family forever. No talk would be complete without it. He says Joseph is essential for a testimony of Jesus and rest of Christianity would say they didn't need Joseph Smith at all. And they still have a testimony of Jesus. But his, I didn't include the clip, but Joseph's, he said that he saw Jesus in a vision and that Jesus got everyone up out of the graves. And Joseph's like, I saw this vision. This is what Jesus was doing. He was resurrected. It was super cool. And he wrote it down. And again, when we compare that to uh, Joseph's other visions, the other changes to those visions, the other contradictions of those visions, the other theology that evolved in those visions, I'm not like putting a lot of stock in like Joseph had a vision of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's true. Like compared with all of the other blatant lies and immoral behavior of Joseph Smith, I'm not like, oh my gosh, I wasn't going to leave in Jesus. I was on the fence about it, but Joseph saw a vision. So I'm on board now. Just it doesn't happen that way. Life that will say things like, well, if only you've read what I've read, then you would, you'd have questions about Joseph Smith, too. If you, if you knew the things that I knew, then you, you would doubt that Joseph was a problem. Well, I don't even want to tell you what I've read, because if you read it, it would destroy your testimony. I, I, I know that there are those voices out there. Whether it's a friend or a family member, a co-worker or a colleague, some random person on the internet or Uncle Joe, the claim is, if only you knew more about Joseph, well, then you wouldn't believe. <clears throat> I can, as unequivocally as possible, testify to you that that is not true. Because you just know there's all these people in the audience going like, oh, my God, I'm like, I'm just really hearing a lot of stuff. Um, Nuance Ho and Mormon discussions uh, have been putting out some stellar content on YouTube lately. People on the Internet have been saying some things. And if only there was somebody who had their paycheck signed by the church itself come and tell me that none of that is true. Give me none of the context. Completely lie to me. Uh Give me a tribal sense to return to the feelings that I rest in and find comfort in. If only I could make that icky feeling going on. I hope that state conference, Garrett Dirtmont showing up. Look, it's your lucky day. You don't have to think about people from the internet anymore. He's there to unequivocally tell you that none of that is true because he studied it for 20 years. Case closed. Oh, feels so good. Or critical thinking skills, <laughs> look at things, look at where people's biases are, and investigate the information for yourself. I very much doubt that whoever you're talking to on Instagram will know more about Joseph Smith than I do. And it's not because I'm special or I'm smart. I've just then tell the truth on him, Garrett. It was my job. If it was your job for 20 years, you'd be experts in it too. Then tell the truth. But I can tell you, having read everything that Joseph wrote, everything that he did, all of the slanders against him, as well as all of the revelations he received, that I am certain that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. The closer you get to studying Joseph, the more you will feel the Holy Spirit testify. And then with that knowledge, you will know that this is God's true church that he set up and that Jesus Christ is at the head of it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example of... All right. Uh, yeah, there's a there's this testimony and stuff. Anything, Bill, before we get into the Q&A? Yeah, so... Uh, if you had read what I've read, here's what I would say to that. Uh, if you get a hundred people and if they are exposed to the deep rabbit hole that is Mormonism, the far and wide majority of them are going to lose their faith in some form or manner and have to uh, take it apart. There are a few people who hang on to things. There are folks who are believers who are informed. But I think for the most part, that's a small minority of folks who encounter the, the deep complexity and rabbit hole of Mormonism. And it should also be noted that those kinds of folks exist in all sorts of faiths. There are Scientologists who know Scientology history and who still believe. There are folks who know Jehovah's Witness history and are Jehovah's Witnesses and they still believe. There's Seventh-day Adventists who know Seventh-day Adventist history and they still believe. There's 
uh, folks in every faith who are informed, they see themselves as having some sort of expertise uh, and they stay and they have some sort of maintained belief. That alone isn't enough to go like, oh, like he's read everything and he believes. So therefore it's all solved. If, if Garrett Dirkmont would let me sit down with him for a 14 hour interview, like I did with Jim Bennett, and we're allowed to go into every one of the problematic areas, I will also have Garrett Dirkmach representing a weaker, less rational position than myself. And, uh, and you can simply weigh that by taking 100 random 50 uh, Mormons and 50 ex-Mormons and play that interview of 14 hours for, for all of them totally. and then see where everybody falls. And I can guarantee you Maybe. that more than 50% would see uh, his argument as the weaker one. Yeah. Or at least they have to kind of have an admission that you might not hear anywhere else from somebody whose job is to defend it. I'll yeah. never forget like John Dillon's Patrick Mason interview where Patrick Mason says, Joseph's polygamy looked a lot like sin. That's yeah, an interesting admission, you know, most rational perspective is it looked like sin. So, mm. and then the most rational perspective is that the God of Joseph, of us, of Joseph Smith, that he was called by Joseph, that he is so unfeeling and uncaring about the horrific traumas of what came out of polygamy, what came out of, you know, extermination orders of Native Americans, that the God of Mormonism really just cares about the sexual needs of its members, them and their land grabs and various other things that the traumas that come out of Mormonism are not a huge concern to this God. And that. That's really interesting. I think yeah. I think we can talk about that enough. All right, now we're into the Q&A. An argument that sounds like a good argument. Uh, why don't we repeat the question? He said, how do you respond to someone who makes a big deal out of the fact there's multiple accounts of the first vision? It's a really great question. And in fact, is at the core of some antagonistic attacks on people's faith. What, what someone should notice right away is that look, historians, we, we, we don't have the ability to prove that a miracle happened, right? I mean, I can tell you that Paul, in his letters, and all the people who talked about Paul, said that he had an experience on the road to Damascus, right? Paul certainly seems to think he had an experience. I do too, but, you know, right? but a historian can't prove that when it comes to Joseph Smith's first vision. You won't find historians who will say things like, well, because Joseph Smith told the story more than once, he obviously was just making it up. You'll find someone on YouTube who will say that. But you won't find a non-Latter-day Saint historian doing religious studies is not going to say the fact that Joseph talked about this, this vision that he had multiple times and the fact that he didn't say the exact same words every time proves he's making it up. You'll find someone on a TikTok saying that, but you won't find someone in a university saying that. Historians expect, in fact, we're giddy about, the idea that there's multiple accounts of things from the past. The fact that there's multiple accounts is something that a historian would expect. Your average member of the church might not because they're not historians. Well, why do we only have one of them published in our scriptures? Well, because that's the one Joseph Smith published to the church and to the world. All right. I just want to stop there for a second. Um, I, Garrett, um, I hate that. Um, that's what we call straw manning. And we don't do that around here because there's not a single freaking person on the internet complaining about the first vision who's saying it's not true because he read it or he wrote it down four times. That's not, that's not the point. Nobody cares that he, he wrote it down four times. That's not what the question was about. The question was about well, what do I do with all of these contradictory accounts? And not just contradictory. There's a main point that people people want to nitpick the differences in the accounts and what Joseph went into the woods to go pray to Jesus Christ for. And people, yes, they get shocked that that's like not this, a story that they heard when they were converted or told on their mission. But there's something that I want to bring up in just a second, but I'm going to let him finish his uh, his uh well, it's not even it's like, like, what's the big deal? Like he told it four times, like Garrett, we're not, that's not what we're, we're not talking about that. <laughs> and it's a really bad a straw man. You really like are disrespectful of, I, I care about people in faith crisis. I care about Mormons, ex-Mormons, everybody. It's just plain disrespectful to not actually meet their arguments at what they are. And he plays this game with historians, right? Like he says, look, historians don't tell us that the first vision isn't true. That's not what historians do. He's right. Historian's job is to lay out the data, but not to make the conclusions. And so he treats it as a uh, he treats it as as if the historians are neutral. The evidence is on both sides. The 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 historians don't draw conclusions because the evidence leads to some sort of neutral position, and that's 
if I can swear here, that's bullshit. Um, <laughs> the reality is that in every single one of the church's truth claims, the historical context and evidence that's available makes the faithful position less than the most rational position on every single one of them. Exactly. Um, that is my favorite sentence of the day. Should you playing it? Let's do it. Okay. It'd be kind of weird to have a different one that he didn't publish to the world, right? But all of those accounts are available on the church's website. You can go to josephmanpapers.org right now, and I think one of the links on the side is to the accounts of the First Vision. So certainly people have the ability to look at them. But I think more than anything, it's the shock value that someone's coming at. The reason why someone makes headway in that argument isn't because there's some you know, Yale University professor of religion that's saying, Joseph Smith talked about the First Vision four times. That proves he didn't have a vision. No, it, it's because it's a shock value of, of, of I didn't know, right? And so someone's like, well, you know, Joseph told that story a different, a different way one time. Yeah, he did. One time he's trying to publish it in a newspaper, so it's much shorter. One time he's writing it apparently to himself, and it's never published. I have no idea what the actual intent of that version was, but he never finishes it. It ends mid-sentence. One time he's having it copied into his journal. And so for, for historians, I mean, I, I think that's probably how I'd respond. I know that's a really long answer. That covers a lot of things when it comes to sources. I mean, a historian can only tell you what sources exist in the past. The Holy Spirit of God can tell you whether or not miracles took place. I can, I can tell you this is what Joseph said happened. And then the Holy Spirit can tell you if miracles happened. Well, well, Garrett, is the only shock value to learning about the multiple accounts of the first vision that Joseph wrote it down for separate times? Um, so just so you know, oh, there's so much information on this. And I'm taking a lot of this from LDS discussions from Mike, taking some of his stuff, putting in my own words. But this was a, I just want to make sure. I'm sourced on this one. So when reading the four primary accounts from Joseph Smith, there's a lot of small differences that are notable being bound by Satan. Maybe you guys have heard this. There's a pill of fire in one. There's a host of angels in one. Uh, but two very significant contradictions arise in Joseph's 19, or sorry, in Joseph's 1832 handwritten account. He claims to have already known all other churches were not true. But in 1838, he claims the reason for prayer was to know which one was true. The number two is in Joseph's 1832 account, just one personage, the Lord, appears. But later in later accounts, he mentions that two personages appeared to him in the 1835 retelling to Robert Matthews. He does not call the personages God or Jesus, but does make those titles clear in the 1838. Again, we don't want to nitpick all the changes of the First Vision account, but these two are incredibly significant. When we look at the changes to Joseph's First Vision accounts, it is important to know why Joseph made the changes that he did. And this is always really interesting because I always want to give people a big picture view. Nitpicking, if I was a Mormon, I wouldn't listen to nitpicking necessarily like this, but if you put it in its wider context... The first vision is the cornerstone of every missionary lesson, but when compared with the other accounts, there are some very problematic discrepancies. One other issue is how the church attempted to suppress the 1832 version when it was discovered in Joseph Smith's letter book. So if you think about, uh, it was a Joseph Fielding Smith or Joseph F. Smith was the church historian at the time. You're muted. And I don't want you to be muted. No, that's okay. Sorry about that. So, um, Joseph Fielding Smith becomes church historian in 1921, and we believe it's sometime in the 1930s or 40s that as the church historian, before he becomes a member of the Quorum of the Twelve and later church president, he cuts out the 1832 account with a penknife, uh, and you can go to the images of that journal and you can see the page taped back in. He had planned to keep it in the vault, but when word got out, he immediately tried to get it back in place and had Paul Chessman write his thesis statement on it so that the church could claim it was the first to talk about the record. Exactly. So it just, there's supposed to be like this mantle of authority, you know, church historians, people who would go later on to hold high leadership, prophetic apostle positions in the church. And if something sunk in them and they said, whoa, this account of the first vision is so different. This is going to be devastating. Let's rip it out. So no one finds it and hide it in a vault for 50 years. That's notable. That's something you wouldn't tell missionaries that. I mean, you wouldn't tell people who are converting to the church that version of the first vision that, by the way, this is very contradictory as a matter of fact, 
They they ripped it out. They hit it. And you know, people, you can you have to touch those touch those books with gloves. They're not just like pen knife ripping stuff out these days. It was a major devastating blow. So that's important context to add. Well, go ahead. Just uh, he also frames it as if the first vision accounts have always been there to read. That's not true. Uh, it's yeah. not until the internet comes along and people are claiming that the leaders are not telling the full history and being deceptive that the church now, only just a few years ago, not too long ago, less than a decade, the church has begun to move towards transparency. Um, in fact, the assistant church historian under Marlon Jensen, I forget, it might have been Stephen Snow, but he makes the comment that the church is entering an age of transparency, and he hopes that we will be even more transparent as time goes on, meaning mm -hmm. they're still hiding things. And so I'm just noting it's only in recent, the last uh, half decade or so, where uh, the first vision accounts have been put onto the church's website and they're available to read. And to note, as you pointed out earlier, that the theology from the 1832 account to the 1835 account to the 1838 account is drastically changing, and it seems to match the same trajectory of theology changing in the Book of Mormon itself as edits are made, and it's republished in 1837 in Kirtland, and then I believe it's published again in the 1840s in Nauvoo. Yeah, that's perfect. Bill, you are so smart. Oh my gosh. I aspire. Uh, yeah. My next slide, I want to get into that as well. So yeah, thank you. That's exactly perfect. And there's, there is a, a shock value for not knowing this. And for, again, they're not very empathetic. They're not very kind. They're just, they're out to these apologists for the church. They're just kind of out to bully people. And it's like, no, you're actually, you're supposed to be like holding a hand with people who are, who are worried that they've never heard these things before. And to say like, it's available. You can go read it right now. Just like, go read it. Like you, you lazy, you stupid, like don't have a faith crisis. Like what's your problem? You know? So yeah, it is really difficult to find and it's not available, but then there, there should be a shock value. It has nothing to do with it. Just being written down just four separate times. If every single one of them like told the same version about we, we, Everything about our entire life of who we are here is to know who is our maker, where are we going, who, what does he look like, what does he want from us, and Joseph has completely contradictory versions of what that is, and this is this is exactly like you know freaking the Catholic Church and uh, Peter and Paul and just the the ideas of a church starting where you don't even have the foundations of who it's being handed over to, that that calls into question the entire the entire paradigm as, as it should. So. Um, these, these are Mike's words from the website. He said, well, I would not claim that first vision to be the biggest problem with church history. It provides a very good window into how Joseph Smith evolved his beliefs and teachings as he grew the church and incorporated other ideas and teachings around him and how those changes led to both retrofitting earlier accounts and even the book of Mormon retrofitting is the word here. Um, the most important change in the first vision accounts is the evolution from one personage, the Lord, in the 1832 version to seeing both God and Jesus in the official 1838 retelling. This change is critical because the evolution from the Trinitarian view to a plurality of gods is something we can see Joseph Smith working on outside of the first vision. You guys hear me on that? But due to this... Um, Evolution, the accounts have to change to be reconciled together. The book of First Nephi changes from a Trinitarian view, original 1830 version, to a plurality of gods in the 1837 version. So you can see that he's working on all this stuff outside of it. So behold the Virgin Mary. You can read all of these. They're on the screen. That the Behold the Lamb of God, yea, even the Eternal Father. This changed to behold the Lamb of God, yea, even the Son of the Eternal Father, so these things just really work in sync with each other. And we know that the first vision accounts were not even important to the first converts of the church, that it wasn't written down until, I don't remember the year. I looked it up last night. Do you know the year that the, I feel like the first vision the accounts first weren't even vision. used until after Joseph was dead, like long after he was no, dead. Long right? after. The first like time the first vision, the first time the first vision is used in the missionary discussions is 1961. In 1961. <laughs> So that should tell you something. That should tell you something. This uh, is all just based one other around... little note too. Uh, yeah. Stephen Harper. Uh, so you shared two points. One was that Joseph claims to have only seen one being in the 1832 and then uh, gods, multiple gods in the 1835 and 1838. And then the first one was Joseph's motivations, like whether he knew no church was true, whether he knew that, you know, and just to note that Stephen Harper 
with the church history department, uh, his apologetic rationale for reconciling that is to go that Joseph Smith felt one thing in his heart and he felt a different thing in his thoughts and head. And that's what you're seeing is the conflict of his feelings versus his thoughts. But again, notice the moment you say that you're adding additional conjecture to explain the evidence. Noted. Well said. Um, let me go back to this. So the question was, uh, Joseph Smith uh, brought back the concept of plural marriage. And, and what, what do we know about whether or not he practiced it? I mean, this is a, a fairly, uh, this is a fairly obviously very sensitive issue for Latter-day Saints, especially in the United States or Europe today. I mean, in, in North and South America as well, um, because plural marriage is seen in such a negative light. And so the, the question is, well, how could the prophet Joseph Smith have received that revelation? Um, I, I think that that's probably something that we won't fully have an answer to in, in this life. Um, if the question is, does Joseph Smith reveal it and does Joseph Smith practice it? Well, you have primary accounts in people's journals from the time, like William Clayton's journal, in which he has multiple discussions with Joseph about Joseph's practice in plural marriage as well as other people. Um, and you also have the affidavits of dozens and dozens and dozens of women who practiced plural marriage in Joseph Smith's time, women like Eliza R. Snow. Um, there certainly are people who, who would want to make the argument that Joseph never practiced it at all. None of those people is a PhD historian of any religion. And that should tell you something. Look, some agnostic or atheist is not desperately trying to, to prove Latter-day Saint theology when they say that Joseph Smith practiced plural marriage. But there's a reason why a Presbyterian historian, a Latter-day Saint historian, a Community of Christ historian, an atheist historian look at the same evidence and they all come to the same conclusion, that Joseph, however reluctantly, taught and practiced it. Now, um, clearly reluctantly. We have multiple, multiple, multiple accounts of this. But um, while it might make someone feel better to say, well, he, he never ever practiced it at all, that's, um, that's an argument they're making by what would make them feel better rather than what, what historical sources demonstrate. Interesting. Interesting. So he admits a lot. I'll give him credit on that. But that is an interesting admission as somebody who's there to defend the church that there's this common thing where people, they'll just believe stuff that makes them feel better. And that's a bad thing to do. We shouldn't be doing that. Don't just believe things just to make you feel better. Mm. And can that logic not be applied? Because I guarantee the person asking that question was like, what do we know about Joseph Smith practicing polygamy? And you can say he practiced it, but they always want to have this fine line between they were ceilings just for eternity, not for actually having sex. And then you have, he's, he's mentioning the affidavits and it's so funny. Hey, Garrett, what are in those affidavits? Garrett, say what's in those affidavits. <laughs> those affidavits are from the, the women who are the wives of Joseph Smith that are collected after the church went into secession and they're deciding who is going to be the prophet. And, uh, all the wives are like, yeah, polygamy, totally. We all slept with Joseph. They have all their signed written affidavits that they were in, in had an actual fully, what's the word I'm looking for? Eh, I'll just, I won't use words. <laughs> Marriage with Joseph, right? And so he's just like, there's these, you know, the affidavits that that's what the history says. But I think he, that's, I just felt, I found, did you find that interesting? I found that psychologically fascinating where he didn't want to say what I think people want to know. Did, they, did he have sex with this woman? That's what they really want to know. But he's like, yes, that's what the history says. We, we can't just say things that don't make us feel better. He was married to more than one wife. That's what it says. But it's like, well, will you say that he had sex with them? Will you say that he manipulated them? Will you say that he promised eternal salvation to them if they married him? Uh, will you say that uh, there were women who didn't want to marry him? Will you say that he almost got tarred and feathers and then his ball sack removed by propositioning the wrong guy's daughter like will you say any of that stuff so i thought that was fascinating happiness is the design of our existence right happiness is yeah. the object of our design sometimes god wants us to bone that's basically what joseph said to that happiness is boning my friend's daughter one of the projects i'm putting together right now is doing some research on what predatory behavior looks like in sex abusers and then going back into these women's stories and seeing if we can find that predatory behavior show up and we do so for instance with i think her name's florence woodworth joseph uses gifts he buys her a watch she's a 16 year old girl joseph gets her a watch and he's uh creating moments where he gets private moments with her uh, you look at Lucy Walker and the short amount of time he gives her to make decisions, yep. uh, the high amount of pressure he puts on her with spiritual penalties and also isolating her away from her family. You look at Fanny Alger, the Partridge sisters, the Lawrence sisters, Helen Mar Kimball, 
the the behaviors of Joseph Smith in all of those situations, it looks really bad, and it just uh, it just seems strange, doesn't it, that Garrett Dirkmont doesn't want to address any of that. Uh, yeah, especially I'm going to play the clip right now where he goes with this again, no critical thinking, no logical fallacies, mm -hmm. apples to oranges, not taking into context any of that stuff that I know, you know, I'm sure Garrett knows all of that manipulation, mm -hmm. all of this precedent that I don't want that to go over people's heads. It's not just that Joseph did this. It's that every prophet after him was like, yeah, marrying 15 year olds, even though I'm 70 years old, dope. If Joseph's able to do this, I'll do that. And then all the break-off sects of, of Mormonism all established a precedent that was from Joseph Smith that's horrendous. And that is that is who this person, he's saying, you're going to lose all these amazing doctrines if you give up your testimony of Joseph Smith. Like what? Well, you know, the one about baptisms for the dead, even Brigham Young got on board with it. No, he didn't. Um, What about like him uh, saying that you can be with your family forever? I can believe that without you. But Joseph Smith gave us so many amazing things. How about like highly manipulated, insanely coercive, disgusting sexual abuse that is not just for what Joseph participated in, but all the prophets, all of the men's, all of the breakoffs, sex, all of the patriarchal bullshit that's all contained within Joseph Smith saying that he's the prophet of God. He speaks for God. You don't. And all of those women, all of these women and children in these families who believe who have this problem now that they believe Joseph Smith is a prophet, just like you do, Garrett. All of them all believe Joseph Smith is a prophet. And the prophet also wants me to marry this guy, like my cousin. This guy is 40 years older than me because because Joseph Smith did it. Like, that's the problem that you have these two painfully conflicting things coming into. It's not just that Joseph is a prophet and he told us about Jesus Christ. I can believe that without you, Garrett. I don't need to believe anything. You didn't reveal a whole, a whole lot. But what he did do is he introduced heinous amount of trauma into the lives of of americans of people all over, all over the world completely unnecessarily forrest clay is it because i was ranting should i go more rants thanks so much love you Kara. i love you bill thanks dude i super appreciate that that's cool um anything you want to say no i'm mad this guy's exhausting yeah okay so let's go into this really stupid thing he says next sweet So can you guys hear what that guy's saying? He says, to me, Joseph Smith actually shows that he says who he says he was, who he said he was, because he was supposed to bring back all of the dispensations and that by, by bringing back polygamy, that shows that he was a prophet of God. Did he bring back animal sacrifice? Did he bring back animal sacrifice? No. Um, How, minus the dog circles with the treasure digging. <laughs> no. Good point. No. And correct me if I'm wrong, biblical scholars and historians, I believe that I don't think Adam or no, sorry. I don't think that Abraham practiced polygamy and I don't think any of the, what Joseph was terming polygamy and the handmaids in the Bible were at all similar, the same, or even condoned by God necessarily. Is that true? Yeah. No, so yeah, for Joseph don't. to say yeah. that, you know, God, that's just what he does. He sends angels with flaming swords for me to marry 14 year olds and stuff. Like that's just him. That's just like his, he's just like, <laughs> Obviously, that's what he does. Like, you guys remember the Old Testament. And everyone's like, no, I don't quite remember God doing that. It's like, well, I'm the prophet. I supersede it anyway. So you you can't win with this stupid kind of argument. He's going to bring back polygamy. That's how you know he was a prophet. Listen to yeah, what this... Bill just said. You know he was a prophet because he brought back polygamy? How? How he brought back polygamy matters. I'm not like anti-polygamous. I'm not anti-poly anything. I'm not anti-whatever situation works for people. But it's about the how. It's about the manipulation. It's about the mantle of authority that you claim to have to supersede people's personal autonomy. That matters. Use your um, brain, people. What do you the want to angel say? comes with a drawn sword to tell you to start pursuing children to enter intimate relationships with them. And... At a different point, God had given you a secret test to discern which angels were from God and which ones were from Satan. But somehow you never consider using your new test of shaking hands to test your flaming, your angel with a flaming sword in order to see if he is from God or not. Hence, you're talking out both sides of your mouth and then you just go off and say, hey, you know, hey, Helen Mark Kimball or hey, Lucy Walker. That angel with a flaming sword said, we're both damned if you don't enter this relationship with me. 
You've got 24 hours. I'll give you 24 hours to think about it. And uh, we'll see if, uh, see if you come back and can do things. But if not, the gates of heaven shall be closed against you. His exact words. After having, after her mother passes away and her dad sent on a mission and she's living in the house with Joseph Smith, uh, and he's taking care of her, as he notes, taking care of her as his, as her own father. And then I have to wonder what kind of heavenly God takes an existing relationship that is being treated by both parties as a parent-child relationship. And then God comes in and alters that relationship to be a husband-wife relationship. Really, going back to the other point about what Joseph revealed, like, could we live without this? <laughs> I can live yeah. without that kind of stuff, you know? Um, also, I just remembered I forgot one more slide that I spent so much time on. Do you guys notice? Uh, I just want to make sure I read this one. This is more about the shock value of learning about the multiple accounts of the first vision. Um, that just so you guys know, just to finish up that point, I think I forgot to read this unless I did. I'm getting tired. Why would these changes be necessary if the Book of Mormon is directly translated from the steer stone? The words did not change in Joseph's hat until the words were written correctly as the Book of Mormon witnesses claimed. Why would Joseph Smith alter these verses that were preserved and translated by the power of God in order to correlate his evolving theology of the Godhead? If Joseph Smith truly saw God and Jesus at the first vision, why would did he not pray to God for revelation when coming across verses in the Book of Mormon that are clearly Trinitarian or when revisiting the Bible and strengthening the Trinitarian view as noted above? Joseph prayed to receive answers to many other questions during this time, but never mentioned the contradictions between what he claimed to witness in the first vision and the scriptures he was producing. Mm. It's like, take him away, Judge Bailiff lock them up. Like we got you on that one. It's just like pretty clear cut for me. And then again, to your point, Jill, Jill, Bill, I get you confused with the, just kidding. I'm getting a little bit tired here. Um, the point is many things in Mormonism where that everything rests on the mantle that this person has the keys that they have. They, they are the one to speak for God. And again, I always, if you hear me say on every podcast that they speak for God and you don't, don't sweep that under the rug. That's really important because everything about these high demand religions are about taking away your autonomy to know what's right and wrong. And if you have a maker and there's a message that that maker wants you to know, and it's not something that you can feel like you're allowed to say, that doesn't feel right. Or I don't want to agree to that. Or you just have to keep going and put things on the shelf. You don't understand. You lose your identity. There's no point of being in that religion. If you don't even have an identity outside of who that person tells you to be, what is the point at the end of the day? So you have all this People are telling you that Joseph Smith is supposed to talk for God and you don't. And these mate, Russell M. Nelson, your leaders, they replace their name with Jesus Christ. Do you have a problem with the church? Do you have a problem with Jesus Christ? That's their new thing. I just did a live stream to that like two weeks ago. You have all of these messages. And then when you actually go to them and be like, what are your revelations? Just like Bill had a great TikTok the other day. It's on his uh, YouTube channel as well of like revelations. Hey, class, what do we got? To our church. <laughs> what are the other ones that you mentioned, Bill? Uh, I've got Just... them written up here. New garment fabrics. Uh, oh, they removed the priesthood ban after putting the priesthood ban in place. Oh, got my rid God. Of the yes, word finally. Mormon. Family home evening. That's a big one. I almost didn't spend time with my family on Monday nights. Thank God. Yeah. There's just... Uh, there's so many... There's for every one, like, oh, that's a nice tenet of Mormonism. You've got, like, 100 that are, like coming to slosh down the mountain in a flash flood to crash into you for a faith crisis. And you're one little like candlestick of like, but I really like the garment fabrics are nicer than they were last year. Ain't gonna stay lit. <laughs> it is a little crazy. Ah, analogy city over here. All right. N -d 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 It, it certainly, Joseph certainly feels as if he is being commanded by God to do it. I mean, it is not a, it, it, it's not a, it, it's not something that is done on a whim, certainly. And, and by the accounts of some of, of his wives, I mean, he, he is struggling with this well into near the end of his life. Why don't they ever want to talk about the, if, if technically, if the revelation still in the scriptures is that, that, uh, 
you need to practice polygamy for the procuring of more children, you could call it. And then Joseph's wives didn't procure any children. Are they not just like talking out both sides of their mouth that like Joseph really didn't want to practice this? He was like, oh, do I have to? I have to. And they all said that they had sex with Joseph. And we know that like birth control and other mechanisms of abortion, not that not that difficult to also pure cure at that time and place in the country. So does that not just say like, like you, you're really expecting us to believe that like Joseph was like, I don't, I mean, I, 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 I got, I, I literally am soft. Like I can't get a boner for all of these hot teenagers. And God's like, just, just try harder. Like I'll, you have to, you have to have sex with them. And God's, he's like, no, please don't make me like men having sex with like teenagers. Like, I think we can kind of get on board that like, wow, he was, he was power hungry in like 25 other ways. It's not that difficult to believe that he was like, and also come to my bedroom tonight and you come to my bedroom tomorrow and I'll give you a house down there. And I'm going to manipulate all of this. Like, does this not just fall in line with every other cult leader that we already know of that all eventually says, I need to marry your wives or your hot daughters. And don't worry. I know it's uncomfortable, but like eternal salvation much. I, you want to pure cure that I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give it to you in spades. As long as your daughter has nice tits. Like there's, there, it's so obvious. Like he's, he's trying to be like, he was just like up racked at night. I was like, no, he wasn't. You're still on mute by the way. Dang it. It's like Mormonism live, you know, yeah. um, you, you nailed it, which is that, if you look at everything about how Joseph Smith practiced polygamy with the underage girls, I don't like that whole young women thing, right? We have that term in the church, young women, but these aren't women. These are children. So with these children who are under the age of 18, um, you look at how Joseph Smith carried out polygamy, the coercive techniques, the isolating these women away from their families. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to coerce them in that way. <laughs> yeah. Like, so then you have to throw God under the bus or you yeah. have to throw Joseph Smith under the bus. And Garrett has no intention. He just let this guy throw out a the stupid old high priest naive point of view that got, you know, that Joseph has to restore all the things from all the dispensations. So we ought to cut him some slack. And Garrett could have easily spoken intelligently that that question was uninformed and he could have shot it down, but he doesn't because mm -hmm. he wants mm -hmm. to cater to the believing side. When you see what Joseph Smith is doing with young women from every facet of it, it looks like predatory behavior. Yeah. And it's not the time to call that out, Garrett. Then what is the time, Garrett? Right now? Um, but it is a difficult concept. And look, part of the problem with studying anything about plural marriage is... We have not very good sources for the first years it was practiced because it was practiced in secret. Second, it's incredibly personal. And so every time it's mentioned, we take it personally. We feel personally about it. And over the course of time, there's 100,000 different people that are in some way involved in it, either the child of a, in a polygamous marriage or a wife in one or a husband in one. And so there are tens of thousands of different stories, just like there's tens of thousands of different stories about monogamous marriages. N none of you would have your friend tell you what a terrible marriage that they're in. And, and you come away saying, you know what? No temple marriages are good. You, you would, you'd come away saying, I'm sorry that their marriage isn't good. Hey, Garrett, um, that's not the argument anyone's making. Um, thanks for strawmining us, though. Um, yeah, the thing that we're not concerned about is that, like, polygamous marriages are bad. That's uh, There's lots of people who practice polygamy all around the world and stuff. It really has to do more with the the way that it's done, that that unequal power dynamic, Joseph's proximity to deity, the patriarchal structure. Um, so don't act like you don't know that. Don't act like you can just throw this out there that like, you're not going to say just because you heard of a bad polygamous marriage, you're going to say that they're all bad because you know you wouldn't apply that standard to monogamy. Garrett, that's not what our argument is. It's about the deceit and coercive sexual predatory behavior. And you know that. And that's why you're a liar. And that's why we're making this video to call you out. It's just ridiculous. This is disgusting, disgusting behavior from Joseph Smith to Warren Jeffs, who wouldn't even exist. We all know Warren Jeffs is horrendous. Warren Jeffs wouldn't exist if, if, if Joseph didn't first do it first. Joseph was the OG and Warren and following prophets got their ideas from him. And so we don't look at polygamy and say, 
well, you know, that, that must mean all polygamous marriages are bad. Polygamy has been practiced all around the world for a very long time. Any like good steward of like world history would know that. And that there are lots of different ways that people have poly marriages and situations and the, the, the liberal progressives are actually a lot more open <laughs> to, to, to the situations that people set their family up. That's not the issue. Like, like, don't straw man like that. We can call you out for it. Sorry for that really long rant, but I'm really no, annoyed. No, no, no. Right that, that's good. This is the only moment in the Q&A where he seems to get a little uncomfortable. They're starting to talk about polygamy. He knows that some of this isn't good. And he basically says, I, like, I'm, I don't have time to talk about this one right now. Like, there is never these moments where these men will sit with an intelligent human being in a conversation that is made available to the general public where they're allowed to be walked through their own reconciliations for these issues. You, you talk like, you know, when you're reading a book and you're like, yes, that sentence, take a picture, put on Instagram. That's how you talk, Bill, where I'm like, that was the most densely articulate sentence I've ever heard. <laughs> Love you so much. Thanks. Um, so it is certainly a, a, a difficult topic. And that's part of the reason why I think it's so important that we focus on whether or not Joseph Smith was a prophet. Because you follow a prophet not because what they teach you is what you want to hear. And all of your gold and all of your, your house and all of your friends and all of your social standing because a prophet tells you to. You leave Ohio for Missouri not because it's great to live in Missouri. And certainly wasn't. You leave Ohio for Missouri because a prophet told you to. You walk across Iowa in the dead of winter and bury your children along the way, not because you love seeing Western Iowa. You do it because a prophet commands it. And look, sometimes that will cause people to say, well, you're just a sheep then if you follow. Yes, that's exactly what I want to be because my sheep hear my voice. At some point, you have to have the Holy Spirit speak to you. And when it does, yeah, there'll be questions that you can't answer. I've got all kinds of questions I can't answer. Maybe the ones I've been asked tonight. Um, but even though you can't answer every question, you'll know the truth of the gospel. You'll always have some things that you can't answer. So you can't just live your life based on if anyone ever says anything to me that I've never heard before, well, then I'm not going to believe anymore. There's always someone who knows more. But you don't even have to have the ability to read to have the Holy Spirit speak to you and tell you that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is the only way you can know these things. And yeah, we feel uncomfortable with some things from the past. We maybe wish they didn't happen a certain way. God only has imperfect people to work with. But we, if we focus on that burning spiritual testimony, I, I think it can help us through those difficult times. So Your elevation, thoughts. so elevation emotion is how we know something's true. If, and go look up elevation emotion. I know you know this care, but to mm -hmm. the audience, the, the warm feelings in your chest, a burning in your bosom. I mean, it's almost the exact same language by which uh, the Holy ghost is defined in Mormon theology. So uh, on one hand, he's saying elevation emotion, your emotional responses is the way for you to know truth. And I juxtapose that with all the other religious systems that also have members who feel spiritually tethered to a testimony in that belief system. And then he also talks about the great sacrifices that all the Mormons made. And so, you know, the church is true because people went West and they moved from state to state mm -hmm. and they followed a prophet's call. And then I juxtapose that with Scientology and looking at like Leah Remini yeah. and all of the stuff that she's done where she's pointed out how people in Scientology feel uh, tethered to the system. So they go join the sea org. You look at uh, the heaven's gate and those people take poison and die in their new Nike shoes uh, at least on some level, again, some of it was imposed, but on some level, Jim Jones gets yeah. people to drink cyanide because they're believers. Every, Prophet told them to. Every crazy, crazy religious system has people who are willing to do the immense thing to prove their loyalty to the system and to stay accepted by their tribe. None of that makes Mormonism true. Going to extremes in the name of your religious devotion, does not that religious devotion true make? <laughs> mm -mm. No. Uh, so it's, it's again, pulling on, yeah, that, that emotional pull that you, I've heard so many stories of people uh, just last night, I was talking to a friend and there's this guy who's right on the fence about leaving the church. And he's like, well, why would our, why would our, you know, ancestors, why would they cross the plains? Like, if the church wasn't true. 
And it's like, oh, sweet, sweet child, you are but a, like the preschool of ex-Mormonism, of critical thinking, of exactly what Bill Real said. People do a lot of things for things that are not true. And there are many reasons. And the most rational answer is not that Joseph Smith was a prophet who also married teenagers and said that black people were from the curse of Cain because you got to take one with the other. Right. The prophet told you to hold slaves. The prophet told you to marry teenagers. If you do it, the prophet tells you to. So that logic is really scary. It's really authoritarian. It's um, it, it leads to a lot of uh, thought stopping. And I don't know. I just, I don't want, I don't want that for humanity. I, I, I don't like that story at all. You mentioned in the beginning thought stopping techniques. He's used them throughout. You, you mentioned just now thought stopping techniques. I just want to say one thing, which is to the viewers uh, of Kara's uh, episode here, for any folks who are sort of either believers or sort of new in this whole, the thing, you know, the church gets messy. I'm going to put a, uh, a URL into the comments. It should be there now. This is Jonathan Streeter's article on fix your faith crisis yes. uh, with one weird trick. And he goes into detail about wood tools and steel tools. And you'll, and if you read the article, it's a very short read. It's actually a very enjoyable read. I really love to read this and end up doing an episode on it at one point. The wood tools are all thought stopping techniques. And they're the way that you dismiss questions, no matter what church it is, they work in all churches to get the believer to just continue believing. But if you want to know whether your church is true or not, you need questions that work to discern which churches are not true and which one is. And those are steel tools and those tools, Mormon apologists stay away from and won't touch with a 10 foot pole. Um, this is the first ever time that I have been on a podcast of any kind bill where somebody else brought up my favorite article of all time. <laughs> this, and so thank you. That's mm -hmm. I, I have also done a video on it where I read most of the article. Cause I did a video about how I, like made Christianity work for myself within Mormonism. And then everyone was just like, and then what happened? And I was like, then the next video was why I don't believe in Christianity. And I use Jonathan Streeter's article as a framework and read a lot of it. I've, I've now that I know these things, I know how to think critically. I'm going to apply these same things that didn't work within Mormonism to Christianity. Sorry, Christians. I like you a lot, but still not your thing. All right. Completely. Um, back at it. So the comment was that we, we, we want to know the truth because that's, I mean, the truth will set you free. I, I think it's important that when we decide that we're going to try to learn more, that we actually go to real sources, right? I mean, I hate to break it to you. Anyone who's posting a meme is not an expert, even if they are using a little historical source that they cite down there at the bottom. Anyone who's just got a great YouTube channel with some wonderful special effects, anyone with a podcast, including myself, does not mean that they are necessarily an expert. And you know, shots fired, personal attacks. Anybody who works as an associate professor at BYU in the history department and like completely compiled the Joseph Smith papers doesn't mean that when he is telling you what he knows about Joseph Smith or church history, that is going to be at all accurate faith, like not faith promoting and not just lie to your face. So shots fired back. Yeah, they make it so that the so the believing scholar, which is in the minority of the people who know the messiness, that the believing scholar is the most trusted source. And I will again, I've had church historians with the church history department come into Family Pond at Hurricane Utah to look at our collection of Mark Hoffman's uh, items and intimate to us as I was asking questions trying to get them to say a little more privately than publicly. And they intimated to me that they believe less literally than they portray outwardly and that the church would have you think they do. Yes, 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 yes. So it's the meme posters. It's the people with the podcast. They don't know what they're talking about, but then the people who defend the church, who give up talks like this privately, they will not even say how much they know what they're talking about. <laughs> Does that make sense? Right. When they're speaking to a faithful audience, 
they won't even say what they know, what they actually believe, what the evidence has confirmed to them. They're still going to go with the faith promoting view. So that's really interesting, Garrett, that, you know, us podcasters and TikTokers and meme posters, you guys can't even trust your own apologists and historians to give you the real deal on stuff. Give my TikTok a try. New on so you'll like me. Um, Mike, thank you so much. Love y'all. Listen to your stream while I work on my own faith deconstruction memoir. Nice. Good Look luck at that with next that. One. Holy shit. That makes this one worth it, huh? Good job, Kara. All you $5 donors and $10. I still love you. Fast forward media. I will not fast forward. I will take you in and bite-sized chunks and nestle you into my chest. Thank you. That's amazing. I'm so proud. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Um, back at it. Got to calm down. I haven't eaten today. That's why I'm. A what? Jonesy. Even if they are, the learned doctors of the day rejected your savior. The people who were most looking for the Messiah are the people who missed the Messiah. That's why we have to learn. Yes, Bill. The people who rejected the Messiah were the leaders within his true and living church with which yeah. he was speaking out against and trying to get them to stop being fair, uh, Pharisees uh, in how they practice their beliefs, paying more yeah. attention to the letter of the law than the spirit of the law and creating yeah. hoops for all the members to jump through. Yeah. Yeah. Just and Garrett knows better than to to pose it like that in that paradigm. Like yeah. that's not that's not accurate to the situation of what we're talking mm -hmm. about. Not only is that that's still just illogical, because you they always want you to operate within their paradigm that Joseph Smith is a prophet, and then also Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. People didn't like him. People didn't like. Well, like what if a faith crisis is we're calling into the entire paradigm into question the Holy Spirit? If that's even an accurate way to know anything, if Jesus Christ. If we know that the accounts were written down 60 to 90 years after he lived, a faith crisis is not just about like Joseph Smith did some things. It's that this entire religious system that I grew up with my entire life doesn't have any solid footing to stand on. And that the song about the wise man built his house upon the rock and the fool's man built his house upon the sand is actually more about like, hey, that's I was, the sand is this church. Like it's about us coming into like a full blown shelf crashing everything that we know about God, religion, everything's coming in to to change our paradigm that we have to operate within. But when you're talking to people who aren't in a faith crisis, so I assume as most people in this audience, you can have these really shoddy, like logically lame arguments. Yeah. And I'll just throw in that you're mentioning that, you know, the four gospel accounts can't be reconciled together. They differ and contradict each other in places. You mentioned that there's distances in time between when each of these were written and I know that Terrell Givens, for instance, faithful LDS scholar, he did an interview. I can't remember what the young man's name is, but he runs kind of a, a believing uh, YouTube channel. And he interviews Terrell Givens. And they have like an hour long conversation. And Terrell spends so much time chopping down all of the assumptions that we have, including he agrees in the interview that the four gospel accounts don't agree. Hence, we should expect to find modern day prophets who disagree. And hence, he doesn't really take any of it too seriously wow not to toot my own horn but um as a satirist is my normal profession um i have a really great youtube video which i th i think it should have more views i'm not gonna say anything where i do an act out of hey we're gonna do a play of at our church for our annual easter pageant Let's get the characters. Who's there? Everyone open up. You'll be in Corinthians. You'll be in Paul. You'll be in Matthew. You'll be in Luke. And they're all reading. And then you're trying to write a script from everyone reading from their four different accounts. And you can't get the actors in. You can't get the script. You can't get the set. You can't get what was said. And you can't get if you can touch Jesus or not. And anyway, it's all very funny when you try to read it out loud together. And it's just really cute because then I get men on the internet who say, <gasps> Yeah, I've studied the Bible my entire life, and uh, I'd like to talk to you about what you think you know about the Bible, to which I reply, I have spent my entire life talking to condescending men on the internet, and I'd like to talk to you about what you think I know about what you know. So, um, I When I tried to post the wood tool, steel tools earlier, I didn't see it show up in the chat. Maybe it did, but I didn't see it. I put in the private chat 
the, oh, it's in the private one. I, like, so in the private chat, I stuck the Terrell Givens YouTube is the middle one. And then the bottom one is the thoughts on things and stuff. The other one I did post earlier, which was Dan Vogel's on, on treasure digging. But I think if folks wish... listen to that Terrell Givens, they'll be blown away at how much ground he gives up about the claims of the church. Ooh, I love a good ground giving. Um, I'm just posting those and then we're going to play back on track. We're almost done. That Jesus is the Christ the same way that Peter learned. Who, who do you say that I am? Oh, some say, men say that I am. Oh, some say that thou art Elias. Some say that thou art Elijah. Some say that thou art one of the prophets. But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered him saying, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. That's the only way to actually know. And everything I've studied in my life is worthless compared to the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way to really know. So I hope you can take that with you. Please don't. He's like, I know that all of these arguments are highly fallacious and super lame. And the only way that I'm able to get people to stay in the church is through the power of the spirit, a.k.a. elevated in emotion, a.k.a. telling mm -hmm. people about my dead brother and all of the ways that we know. Obviously, we want to keep feeling warm feelings and know where we go when we die. And we can only know. My arguments, they don't hold up. I've studied this in my entire life. And obviously, this is a completely unconvincing argument full of like fallaciously like misleading statements. But if you just like feel the sincerity in how I'm talking at this certain pace that has been like studied by psychologists to invoke a certain emotion within you, uh, you'll know too that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God and that God is really into uh, – changing people's skin colors based on the sins of their forefathers and uh, I, say this name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I just had the, I felt a warmth in my chest and my hair stood up on the back of my neck. So I know that what you just said was true. That's how it's done, but only in this religion. And if it's a break off of this religion, it still doesn't count. It doesn't count. Same book, same early prophets. Huh? Ne you, you still need yeah, to the evidence matches, but that evidence isn't true. Yeah. Several important. Somebody asked, who is this guy? His name is Garrett Dirk Matt, and he is a BYU prof associate professor of history and religion and worked on the Joseph Smith Papers Project as like the lead editor. And he is at a state conference in my stake that I grew up in in Provo, Utah. Probably my parents are probably in that audience right now, actually. My friends, my family, my people I know, yeah. they're talking right it's now. Easy answers for the questions. Hmm. Let your testimony be rocked by someone who has some pithy thing that they think they're going to share, which, by the way, someone told them about. They weren't in an archive looking that up, by the way. Let me just call. Mainly because mm. those guys won't exactly yeah. let us into all the archives we want to get into. What a dumb argument. Like, OK, where he's uh, to, to steal man, what he's trying to say is like, you're going to hear things about the church that are going to be negative about Joseph Smith or whatever. But all that, all you're hearing was just like told by somebody else and they weren't the ones in an archive. But he still just said though, that even if it's a historian that doesn't have a faithful perspective, it doesn't matter because every amount of studying that he's done doesn't matter at the end of the day. Cause the only way to confirm the truth of something is through the Holy spirit, which we know is a terrible epistemological structure for knowing and coming to truth which then calls into question, who's this God? Who's this God who, who knows that's how the structure is set up? I can't get in the archives, so I can't get in the archives. I have to rely on hearing stories from other people. I can do my best critical thinking. I can use the brain that God has apparently given me. And if I hear that story from somebody else and it sounds a little pithy, Garrett's like, just ignore it. Rely. I hate that my hair, damn it, I just realized that we have the same haircut. Right now, I did my hair like Garrett's today. But he's like, if it's pithy <laughs> and somebody else told it to you, rely on the terrible epistemological structure that I just talked about. Okay. Yeah. I don't feel like I don't feel like it, though. I don't, it just doesn't. I'm just not. It's not a good vibe. When hair you look at, them. like, this guy's been talking for whatever it was, an hour. And if I asked, like, what did he really say? And he just hasn't really said much at all. They never really answer, you know, people don't really get the chance to ask questions in real time and get real answers to them. There's always these ways in which we dismiss and deflect and obfuscate the actual problem and crux of the issue. 
Exactly. Close, again, by just sharing my testimony with you that I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. I know this is God's true church. I know that we don't have answers to all the questions. Yes. And I know as someone who has desperately Close in their life tried to find answers to things, that that's really frustrating. I know it. But I'm just asking for those of you who are struggling to have a little bit of grace with yourself and with what you know. With you. You don't, you don't have I thought that. that was interesting. Nobody does. But have you felt the Holy Spirit speak to you? Have you felt the Spirit when this dear sister sang that song? Hmm. That Spirit's testifying to you that Jesus is the Christ, Joseph is his prophet, and this is God's true church. Amen. Ah, woman. Amen. So I just thought it was interesting that he wraps everything up of just like, remember the spirit. We don't need to know everything. Have grace for yourself, but keep going along the same track that makes you always start back where you always come back to where you started, which is that uh, the church is true. No matter how much information you learn, no matter how many sources, original documents, how many things you read, how many things like are daggers in your heart of like, Ugh, I wouldn't like if my prophet did that he's like people are always just complaining that they have to deal with joseph smith having to deal with him no you should be grateful for him because he gives you this this and this completely inconsequential thing that you could believe on your own that nobody cares about but i'm kind of more concerned about like the 100 other things with like devastating ramifications no just keep coming back to that that we don't understand it we just uh, you know we have these uh, finite vessels that we're able to to operate within but then if you if you go outside of that that vessel and you think you know better than God, well then obviously screw off. That's that that couldn't be possible. So it's this this whole paradigm that just makes me sick, that just makes me sad for people who are stuck within it, that they think that they need to keep putting things on a shelf and keep going with this elevated emotion and stuff. And that can be beautiful. Communal conversion. I had a great time in Mormonism. I spent 29 years in Mormonism and I loved it for the most part. But at the end of the day, it's not a true thing and okay. it's gonna limit your growth. Because it's there's there's wider, more expansive views of spirituality and knowledge and stuff. When you got to keep making excuses for why your prophet and why your church wants to take away gay marriage and stuff, Whew, it gets pretty exhausting. What do you have to say, Bill? This felt like an hour of give brother Joseph a break. So it felt like an hour of give brother Joseph a break, a and then we we've, we've mentioned a couple times thought stopping techniques. I'll just teach the the class here, one of them. So we all know this quote from Elder Uchtdorf. Doubt your doubts. And the way a thought stopping technique works is it implores you to see that whether the data says so or not, your belief gets to stay. And doubt your doubts is a way to dismiss the questions that would lead you to deconstructing your faith, right? Like doubt my doubt. Like I have doubts that Joe Smith's first vision is true. Well, doubt your doubts. But it's really not the doubting of your doubts that's actually useful it's because if that was true then the doubting of the doubting of your doubts would be useful and the and but it's not but the doubting of the doubting of the doubting of your doubts is useful but the doubting of the doubting of the doubting of the doubting of your doubts is not useful and when you notice that the exercise is designed to always point you back in one direction you recognize that the technique was only there to get you not to think in the first place. And that's the truest thing. Yeah. The admission is that they're not there to get you to think. No. In the Just first stay. place. Pay tithing and stay. Yeah. Also, Colby. Yeah. I've heard Just his name a few times recently. Um, has Colby been on your show yet? I don't. He's, uh, he's making a podcast rounds this week. I know RFM and Kobe, I think, have a great relationship, and I sometimes get some some things uh, get some things behind the scenes with Radio Free Mormon and things that are oh, being wow. worked on. So, just a shout out to Kobe because we I was on Mormon Stories on Monday, and uh, John Larson it was John Larson night once a month, and mm. John Larson's connection wasn't working, and I was like, Kobe Radish, yeah. come in NBA Finals off the bench, come in here, dude. <laughs> And he did, it was so good. It was so, so good. But John didn't oh, keep sweet. it up. I think John, we had too many technical difficulties. And he didn't want to leave it up. And I was, I was heartbroken. But Colby was saying that he's like the only like ex-Mormon speaker head who has something guest that doesn't have his own podcast, but he's been on like yeah. four podcasts this week. Yeah. Colby. Anyway. Well, thanks so much for doing this with me, Bill. Any other final words, thoughts? Just basically, if I know Bill real, he's, he's like, doubt your doubts. Just, and also... <laughs> 
give jo- brother joseph a break uh yeah the, the only thing i would add is, if i don't mind giving a plug for tonight's show on mormonism live yeah, yeah. we're going to talk about all of this uh, sec stuff but from a little bit different angle uh it's been hashed out a bunch but when i sat down i think it was yesterday morning and read the eight page report from the sec I was blown away by how egregious the uh, fraud that these men carried out in their investment strategies was. It's way more than they're saying, way more than believers are talking about. So tune into Mormonism Live tonight. Otherwise, I think this was incredible. I I listened to that whole thing yesterday with with Dirk Dirk Mott, and uh, uh, you summed it up by cutting it down into probably not more than 20 minutes of actual material that we hashed on and it was just a it was a bunch of good stuff so i appreciate the chance to sit with you and have that conversation it's important yeah thanks so much bill i just reached out i'm always just excited anytime that you get to help me with this we had another one about justice smith's uh plagiarisms that was really Mm -hmm. popular and when i was preparing this one i was like oh guys hasn't seen anything yeah i was like i'm gonna like color code this one or <laughs> whatever anyway you thanks killed for doing it. this it was really good i know you're a busy guy appreciate you um anything else you want to plug um besides just mormon discussions make sure i'll have a link below you can follow our youtube channel and their Sweet. facebook page i can again repeat bill real single-handedly deconverted me from mormonism some people are john delin groupies some people are john larson fangirls some people are zelf on the shelf kids or x malex kids or you know, everyone's got their little person who did it. Bill, can't thank you enough. I'm here. Anyone who yeah. likes me, it's all because Bill went out there and turned on a podcast mic and was born. Um, it is amazing the people that blaze the path before us and we benefit from the things that they share. Yeah. Yeah. So super grateful for you, dude. I'll let you go. Okay, and, we'll drop uh, off. All right. Have fun. I'll just keep plugging my stuff. Um, yeah, guys, thanks so much for doing this. If you can tell, I took a lot of time yesterday. I read a book. (laughs) I sped read a book and then I sped read it back four times to make sure to give a good explanation of Mormonism unveiled because it like really had never been done before. So I have about five more minutes. If anyone has any Q and A's or anything you guys want to leave right now while I just, again, thank you guys for tuning in and like the super chats have been amazing. Last chance to get one in. Um, but uh, I have a Patreon. If you don't know, Patreon is just like another platform, kind of like YouTube, but you pay, you can five, ten dollars whatever you want to tip. Um, and I put up all of these YouTube videos as without YouTube. Yeah, it's the word Co- commercials. So they don't have ad breaks on there. And I also upload just the audio files for podcasts because I know you guys are just like busy working away, tinkering on your toys and you want to be able to listen to something. So I made all of that available for all the stuff I've been doing in the last couple of years. So I also have a donor box. You can just, you know, set these monthly recurring donations and stuff of, I have to say one thing, all of these ex Mormon podcasters and stuff in this space, have been doing it a long time. have all told me that sustainability is the key to figure out a way to be sustainable. And I can make a promise to try to always put up stuff at least once a week. I have a lot of TikToks and shorts and things and longer format videos like this that take a lot of research and time and wrangling of my friends to come in here. So if you appreciate them, it really means a lot to make it sustainable and to feel like there's a good support behind it. So that happens with reoccurring donations on DonorBox or Patreon. So, and they don't take very much of a cut as much as YouTube. YouTube takes a lot more of a significant cut, I think, um for your super chats but i know i know when you're impulsive you just want to put it right in there so they just they're a little more money grubby than donor box or patreon so kara do i have any connections to the burrell bottling company in springville no i don't and is it spelled like that nope i don't nuance ho you're my person thank you virtual hug um yep if you guys like this please make sure i know you guys are like busy commenting over here on this section but it's always good to leave a comment and be like my favorite part was when kara said that thing that sounded so smart and she's so beautiful and i loved her wine mon jared sweater too (laughs) and i will ignore the fact that her hair looked exactly like garrett's for this entirety of the episode so comments little bell notification hey just like when I upload a new video, it'll be like, you know, let's upload a new video. And then you'll just 
run over there and watch it and comment and the algorithm will just swoop me right up and take me into the wings of love on YouTube. So um, I've got a hella sore throat right now. I'm going to go rest and die um, and put my life, put my, my life and heart on the line to do this. So thanks so much, Uncle Maui. Don't worry. I have your sex toy that I'm sending you in the mail right now. If you guys didn't know, I have a giveaway going on with Belessa um, over on my other YouTube video. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I did a poll of like, what do you guys want to see? It's like personal stories, nut shots at apologists or history breakdowns and stuff like that. And uh, and apologists, nut shots was, was the top. I, I hear you. And then personal stories was the lowest. So I knew that my telling my birth stories of going from Christian birthing to birthing as an atheist were not going to be like, mega popular or whatever, but it does, um, felt nice to give away sex toys. We laughed, we cried and, um, had a great video with my, my best bud, Samantha Shelley, um, that I uploaded on Sunday. So if you want to get a free sex toy, free vibrator or gift card, go, go check out that video and stuff. And if you also just like want to laugh, want to cry, want to hear about all of the ways that my vagina left Mormonism, that's what I'm offering in that video. So, all right, I'm dropping off now. Thanks again. And uh, see you next week. Bye, everybody.